Sometimes I discover something startles me that some person that you think knows spiritual truths, they miss the entire thought. They don't get it at all. You wonder where they've been. And there are people that have been studying the Bible for years that are like that. Um, we have people that also say things like, you know, can a Christian have a demon? Or how can a Christian have a demon? Christian can most definitely have a demon. I cast demons out of Christians all the time. I share the same sentiments that the late Pastor McGee had. I too was startled when I heard Naja teaching, professing born again believers during an online Christian life coaching class that Christians can be demon possessed. She was so sure of this that she said, and I quote, Christian can most definitely have a demon, end quote. I was startled again when she added that cancer and inflammation are generational curses. I was appalled that she made such bold claims, especially when she's not an oncologist. By the way, she mentioned inflammation, but of what specifically? I don't know, because she didn't expound on it. Just making broad brush claims as she oftentimes does. And that's dangerous and ignorant. Give or take, she has over 44,000 followers on YouTube and over 29,000 followers on TikTok and 3.3 thousand followers on Instagram. With such a large audience, I could only imagine if she reaches more professing Christians with this erroneous teaching that's shared on her platform and on other Christians' platform, I just had to speak up and blow the whistle. So I reached out to my cousin, who is a born again professing believer in our Lord Jesus Christ. And I asked her, can a Christian be demon possessed? And to my amazement and surprise, she agreed with Naja. I strongly disagreed with her and she strongly disagreed with me. And so we talked for almost one hour pulling up various passages in scripture that would have answered this question one way or the other. We biblically examined the words possession, oppression, backslidden, apostasy. We searched the word of God so that we could get the proper understanding of these things that can hinder our walk with the Lord. What started out as just a question suddenly became a biblical study for me. My cousin and I wrestled lovingly over this question for almost four days. You see, I've mentioned the impact and influence Naja's platform and outreach has in times past, but I didn't know that it would hit close to home in this way. Naja still teaches the meaning of repetitive numbers when she sees them and claims that she's not practicing divination. This will be dealt with again in this video and her word of knowledge prophecies will also be examined. I understand that she has an impressionable personality and charisma, along with an effective and oral communi communicative skill, which all makes it the easier for her to make connections with Christian women who are unmarried, divorced, or single. And like many, she too is a mom. She's written a testimonial book of her deliverance from New Ageism to coming to the saving grace and mercy of Jesus. She's a certified Christian life coach, motivational speaker, and a deliverance minister. She professes her love for Jesus, and that's wonderful. But even this doesn't excuse her of teaching erroneously and speaking for God when he has not given her a prophetic message. She may very well have walked away from the New Age philosophy and practices, but there seems to be some dross remaining in her. Her dealings and affiliations with publicly known charlatans are concerning. Birds of the same feather flock together is an old English idiom that means people with similar interests, personality, or character tend to associate with each other. 
Because she openly shares whom she learns from and what ministries she supports. I want to give a huge shout out and props, okay, to all of those that were involved in Come Out in Jesus' Name. Alexander Pagani, Isaiah Saldivar, um, Mike Signorelli, Vlad, um, Pastor Greg Locke. All of them were absolutely amazing and many of them have been very instrumental in my teachings and learnings about deliverance, especially Alexander Pagani. He actually laid hands on me and prophesied over me that I would be doing what I'm doing right now. So it's amazing to see them on the big screen. It's amazing to see how deliverance and prayer broke out after the movie where we were holding hands as women and men and praying and delivering people. It was awesome. You guys did an amazing job. They broke down everything in regards to deliverance, got rid of any misconceptions, and people are waking up. They're waking up. So glad for them. I would have not known that these people are oftentimes familiar with one another and work with one another. This is a serious and very deep network. And just like Bar Jesus in the book of Acts, chapter 13, verses 6 through 11, these magicians are very much still active today and even more so amongst God's people and making it hard to discern who is true from who is false in these end times. So what's in this for me making this video? Nothing. Nothing at all. Only that Jesus be glorified and exalted. Satan is a liar and a deceiver. There's no truth in him. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, we are taught that for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I also realize that no matter how many trusted men and women of God reprove, rebuke, and correctly try to teach and counsel persons who follow these charlatans, they close their eyes and ears and remove their brains and say, I quote, well, God didn't tell me anything and reveal anything to me about so-and-so. You just don't like so-and-so, end quote. But no, that's not what this is all about. But what is happening is that we're in a time and have been for a long time now where 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 3 and 4 says they will not endure sound doctrine but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned Unto fables. So many Christians today, and for a long time now, has turned Christianity into a modern day den of thieves. Speaking engagements, book sales of their testimony, selling oils that they prayed over for you. I'm not going to release Jesus yet until December 31st. These are 24, 2024 aisles. And uh, I'm bringing them to the mountain, so I'm not going to release them. As you can see, guys, the buckle bigger than before, and uh, this is what I do not, guys. More want to all right. But by the buckle them, as you can see, click click power, glory and power. Um, my buy the labels because we want everything what we are doing. We want it of a brand. Not only that, where it come from, you know. So this is, uh, God give me this. God give me this. And be here. 2024 must, must be different. So I'm going to pray for them from now. What's the cost? I don't really have a cost, honestly. Just let, just give me a token fee. But please, guys, just use your conscience. As you can see, we get the bigger buckle. So it can last look it can last longer. Mark you, I want you to drop 
your aisle in your bag. Business people always use your aisle for your hand. Please. Whenever God give me this, I remember praying that. That's why I love midnight prayer. You know, midnight prayer give me this the aisle. You know, and um, people can testify with the aisle and everything. Midnight prayer give me this. My see, you see, see me like you see the fire with the purple. That's what I see, and I could have tell. This is why prayer is very important, guys. And this is what I do. What I see, whatever God giving me. This is what I do. So I may, may leave Uno for just these your contents. Give me a token. Give me a token and then come and get your eyes. I'm gonna do something prophetic. Mm, watch this. I gotta dig out this, right? There's something that you have to speak to the earth. Spiritual people understand spiritual things. I have my last. You have to always travel with a last in a car. The way, oh God, do the thing. Hey, Jesus. Ain't it easy, you know, God? I did the same for this morning, too, you know? Arabadoshi katapadaba. You have to dig the aisle. You have to lift the buckle. This morning. So I got a dream, guys. The other day. And they were saying... We took the place to the aisle and, and, and the lady said no. And it was about me. And the lady said, Don't wait up the place with the aisle. No, because we want to put the aisle in the earth. So anything that wants to fight against her, it will not work against her. And that's how God give me this tragedy. And this is why I love God and this is why I love to be a praying person. I'm gonna show you what I see the lady do. So we are speaking. Father, I speak over this oil and I declare in the name of Jesus. Watch a mosquito about me. And the lady said, Don't sprinkle the oil, turn the oil into the ground, into the earth. So I declare if you're underneath the sound of my voice, you will have a testimony. Watch God. I declare in the name of, and I can tell you from I do that. God will give you strategic, prophetic things. In the name of Jesus. So I got the vision. And the Lord said, the lady said in the vision, you see the earth, everything come from the earth if you know. So whatever, in the earth and with the earth wall up for you this morning, O E Earth. And when I get this dream, the lady said, Watch it. The lady said, Stop the aisle in the earth. Like that. Stop the aisle in the earth. That anything that is fighting her, it can't stand. I speak today, and I anoint the earth, and I declare in the name of Jesus Christ that whatever fighting you today, it has ended as November 8th, O-E, earth, whatever that is mine and God's people, I release it now in the name of Jesus Christ. As I pour the oil, I declare the oil of greatness, the oil of champion, the oil of success, the oil of salvation, the oil of deliverance, come forth in the name of Jesus Christ. And I declare that it is so in Jesus' name. Amen. You pray your shawls that they're selling to you paid conferences to attend throughout the year every year i mean am i missing anything here many reputable ministers of god have been calling out many of these charlatans for some time now ephesians chapter 5 verse 11 says take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness but instead expose them end quote I do at times believe that nausea means well, but there are also times where I wonder. 
Is she unknowingly being used by the devil to teach erroneous things? I don't truly really know, but I do know that she and many others who operate in this same way are all sincerely wrong. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 14, and I quote, That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. End quote. So here we go again. I'm of the opinion that many of us have a great deal of head knowledge, but we lack that personal love to him and that devotion to him that is so needed today, and we've lost the reality of his presence. We know all about the theology, but we don't know him. And that is our desire. Can a Christian be demon-possessed? No, a Christian cannot be demon-possessed. You want my scripture? 1 John 4, 4 says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now, the one that's in us is the Holy Spirit. Again and again, we're told that we're indwelt by the Spirit of God. If you're a child of God, you're indwelt by the Spirit of God. Paul put it very bluntly when he said, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And we are told that that's one of the marvelous, wonderful possessions that we have today. It's one of the great comforts that we have in this day in which we live that we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Now, do you believe that the Holy Spirit would indwell an individual along with a demon? I don't think so. fact of the matter is, the Lord Jesus gave a very interesting parable. He said that there was a certain man that was swept, cleaned, and garnished, and the demon that was in the man went out. And then the man got all cleaned up, but he was a vacant house. And when the demon finally wandered around, came back, brought his friends with him, well, the last estate of the man is worse than the first. Why? The man was cleaned up, but he wasn't indwelt by the Spirit of God. You see, that is the thing that is essential today. And then to know that you are indwelt by the Spirit of God born of the Spirit, indwelt by the Spirit. That's a great comfort today, friends, and is one that I'm sure should comfort your heart and your mind that you cannot be demon-possessed. You know, there's a lot of discussion about this question, has been for many years, can a Christian be demon-possessed? Uh, let me start with looking at that word demon-possessed and suggest that's not the best word to use. The, the Greek word that would be the equivalent of this is really to be demonized. And I think we do better if we think of it in terms of being demonized and ask, can a Christian be demonized? The idea that a Christian could be possessed by demons, possessed in that sense by Satan, and totally under his control is completely contrary to the Gospels that tell us we are bought with a price, we belong to the Lord, and Jesus is the Lord of our lives who owns us and possesses us. Now, an unbeliever who is already serving Satan, an unbeliever who is already outside of the kingdom of God, would be dominated by demons in a different way. But could a Christian be demonized? Could a Christian be under oppressive forces from Satan that even bind them through lies? Yes, that is certainly possible. And there's a fascinating account in Luke, the 13th chapter, a woman who had been crippled for 18 years. Look at what Jesus says when he sets her free. Ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, 
be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. She was bound, the scriptures say in Luke 13, she was bound by a spirit, not the Holy Spirit, a demonic spirit. It physically affected her body for 18 years, and then Jesus liberated her as a daughter of Abraham who ought to be free as a child of Abraham. Can the same thing potentially happen to a believer, someone who knows Jesus, someone who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and somehow there's a stronghold in their life? Somehow they open the door to the enemy. Yes, we can open the door to the enemy. Yes, we can believe lies. Yes, we can play games with sin. Yes, there could be some other kind of attack, and there could be a stronghold in our lives that we need liberating from, be it mental, spiritual, physical, or something else. So in that sense, a believer could be demonized in that they are under the power of Satan in a certain area of our lives, while, of their lives, while still belonging to the Lord. The, the reality is, though, we do not have to stay in that state for one split second. If the Son sets us free, we are free indeed. If we continue in the Word of God, we are His disciples. We know the truth. The truth sets us free. These are verses from John, the eighth chapter. And having died to sin, we are no longer enslaved to it, and we are no longer under the power of the evil. And 1 John five nineteen says that the whole world lies into the power of the evil one, but we are of God. So it's only if we open the door somehow that we can come under these demonic powers. But in Jesus, there is absolute liberty. We can be 100% free of them for life. And we ought to be. Today we're going to be dealing with a topic that really gets personal with Christians. And, and there, there are segments within Christianity that hold to a certain view that we know is unbiblical. So here's a question. This is an email from Kyle. He says, many believe that Christians can be possessed, but many think that demons can enter as a squatter or intrude in Christians when they get involved in things such as porn, drugs, and other addictions. Can demons possess Christians? I don't know if I read that first part there. It's right. many believe that Christians can't be possessed, but many think that demons uh, can enter as a squatter or intrude in Christians when they get involved in things such as porn, drugs, and other addictions. Can demons possess Christians. So, Ray, there are people today in church services that actually try to exercise Christians. What do you think of that? Uh, it's, it's silly because we're possessed by the Holy Spirit. And I'm not thinking very deeply about this because I was going through the alphabet trying to think of that guy's name who sang that song, I Left My Heart. <laughs> Squirrel! Uh, San Francisco! Oh, boy. And uh, so let's cross over to Mark Spence to get his wonderful thoughts on this. <laughs> you guys are unbelievable. Uh, can, can a Christian become possessed by a demon? Uh, the answer is simply no. A Christian cannot be possessed by a demon. Oppressed, perhaps. Possessed, no. You know, greater is he that is in you than he that is also in you, the text would say. So listen, as a Christian, Ray, you did get it right. The Holy Spirit lives inside of, habitates, tabernacles inside of a Christian. And as a Christian, I am ruled and reigned by God himself. And because I'm ruled and reigned by God himself, there is no more room for anyone or anything else. So I am hidden in Christ, and the enemy can bark. He can try to do whatever that he's going to do, but listen, it's nothing more than that. It is a bark. I'm not going to come up against the enemy. I'm going to let God do his job. I'm not going to worry about that, but I'm going to worship God freely. And I'm not going to be giving myself over to the things that are mentioned here, like porn, like drugs, things of this nature. Why? Because I please to do those things that are pleasing to him. So short answer, no, a Christian cannot be possessed by a demon because he's already possessed by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, absolutely. So I want everyone to stop worrying. I thought of the guy's name. It's Tony Bennett. Okay, I feel better now. We can move on with the program. Tony Bennett and demon possession. They just go hand in hand, mm -hmm. friends. 
All right, we got that out of the way. We're going to hear from Tony Bennett's lawyer. Right, we will. Yeah, no, Mark and Ray both nailed it. A Christian cannot be demon-possessed. And John MacArthur put it well. He said, there is no clear example in the Bible where a demon ever inhabited or invaded a true believer. Never in the New Testament epistles are believers warned about the possibility of being inhabited by demons. Neither do we see anyone rebuking, binding, or casting demons out of a true believer. The epistles never instruct believers to cast out demons whether from a believer or unbeliever, Christ and the apostles were the only ones who cast out demons, and in every instance, the demon-possessed people were unbelievers. The collective teaching of Scripture is that demons can never spatially indwell a true believer. A clear implication of 2 Corinthians 6, for example, is that the indwelling Holy Spirit could never cohabit with demons. So Absolutely. it's important, friends, again, on things like this, Ray, that we go to Scripture and not to man's opinion, because that's typically where people go when they're not making the Word of God their foundation. Yeah. Absolutely, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think any demon can stop someone coming to Christ. Right. If God's drawing them to Himself, and think of Legion. Uh, he fell at the feet of Jesus, and the demons did not stop them, him from coming to Christ. Right. And also, um, if, if so-called Christians are having problems with demonic possession, the scripture to look at is submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. And if someone's got demonic problems, it's usually because they're not submitted to God. And I've found people that hate their father, hate their mother, have got bitterness in their heart, open themselves to the demonic realm. Um, give no place to the devil, scripture says. If the devil's got place in your life, it's because you're giving it to him in some way. So if you submit to yourself to God in absolute repentance, God banishes uh, demonic influences from your life. Right. Yeah, and the way that it's been commonly put is that a Christian cannot be possessed, though they could be oppressed. Right. Where there's demonic oppression, where, where the enemy uh, is, is trying to come against you. Paul often spoke about Satan's, you know, attempts to, to try to thwart what they wanted to do and so forth. Uh, and so it's important that, to remember that there is a difference there because we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, promise as Scripture says. Yeah, and if the Spirit of God dwells in us, how can the Spirit share us with, with a demonic uh, host or, or, or demonic presence, yeah. us being the host and the Spirit indwelling us? MacArthur went on to say, he said in Colossians 1.13, Paul says, God delivered us from the dominion of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. Salvation brings true deliverance and protection from Satan. In Romans 8.37, Paul says, we overwhelmingly conquer through Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15.57, he says, God gives us the victory. In 2 Corinthians 2.14, he says, God always leads us in triumph. And in 1 John 2.13, John says, we have overcome the evil one. And in 4.4, he says, the indwelling Holy Spirit is greater than Satan. How could anyone affirm those glorious truths yet believe demons can indwell genuine believers. Yeah. So there you have the word on it. And I think Mark Spence has more to weigh in with. I, I don't. I was simply agreeing with you, but I was reading this quote here. It says that the enemy will not see you vanish into God's company without an effort to reclaim you. You know, the, the enemy doesn't just simply turn a blind eye. Ray, you're talking about, you know, can an individual uh, be held back by Satan or by demons from coming to Christ. No, you know, whatever God does and desires to do, He's going to accomplish those things. But this doesn't mean He's going to walk away. And as Christians, we are continually tempted. We have temptation from every side. The enemy is waiting for that opportune time when our guard is down to attack us. So we're always on our guard. You know, I'm about ready to do a biography of David Brainerd. I'm going to be uh, doing a bio sketch on him at a conference uh, coming up next month. And one of the things uh, that I read about him that was very, very interesting to me was he said that uh, uh, the enemy continually tried to hold him back, it seems, every time he had this desire to want to pursue God, pursue Christ in his private devotional times. And it seemed like the enemy was continually uh, battling him with melancholy, or as we would call it today, depression. He was continually living a depressed life. He died at the age of 29 in the house of Jonathan Edwards, who's no stranger to the attack of the enemy. You know, in Isaiah 14, it talks about Lucifer falling out of heaven at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. Now, here's the enemy wanting to be like the Most High God, and he grabs a hold of a horde of the demons, one-third of the demons, and is banished, really, down here to earth. What do you think they're doing? They are very active to try to slip and trip you up. 
Why do I believe in Satan and demons? Because Jesus talks about Satan and he talks about demons. Right. And the greatest authority on the subject has spoken up. So when somebody else comes along and says, listen, a Christian can be possessed, or somebody else comes along and says, hey, there's no such thing as Satan. There's no such thing as demons. I could say, who are you? Because the greatest authority has spoken up. So if you're going to begin to speak up, make sure you echo the words of Christ. And as Greg Bonson said, we think God's thoughts after him, which simply means this. As God leads us by his spirit, and he will, as we open up his word, we can learn and believe and trust that God is in control and we need not fear any man. And the man who fears God doesn't need to fear Satan, demons, or anyone else. Yeah, amen. Joining me today to discuss the answer to the question, can Christians be demon-possessed, is our brother in Christ, Dave Jenkins, who's the executive director of Servants of Grace and the author of books about how to study the Bible. Dave, thanks so much for joining us and for answering this important question. Can Christians be possessed by demons? No. Uh, no Christian can be um, indwelt by a demon because we have been born again. Um, at the moment of our conversion, we are given the Holy Spirit, and he comes to indwell us. And so the Holy Spirit uh, lives inside of us, and he is helping us to know the truth and and God, by his grace, what, through what we call the means of grace, he's using the word and, that we hear and study and meditate and memorize, and he is taking it and drilling it down deeper and deeper into our lives. There's no way for a Christian to be indwelt by uh, a demon. In Colossians 1.13, Paul says, God delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. And so salvation brings with it true a deliverance, a protection from Satan. And in Romans 8.37, Paul says, we are overwhelmingly conquerors uh, through Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15.57, he says, God gives us the victory. In 2 Corinthians 2.14, he says, God will always lead us in triumph. In 1 John 2.13, John says, we have overcome the evil one. And in 1 John 4.4, 4, he says that the indwelling Holy Spirit is greater than Satan. So how could anyone affirm these glorious truths and yet believe that, uh, believe that demons can indwell genuine believers. Paul says this, interestingly, in 2 Corinthians 6, 15 through 16, what harmony has Christ with Belial, or, or what a, has a believer in common with an unbeliever, or what agreement has a temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Um, God says that he has delivered us, speaking about believers, from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. And so how could anyone affirm these glorious truths and yet believe, believe demons and dwell believers? The answer is we cannot, in Colossians 1.13, from the kingdom of darkness king, to the kingdom of Lord Jesus. And so there's no way for a believer to be indwelt by uh, demons now. In Matthew 12, Christ rebuked those who were following him just for the sake of witnessing greater signs and miracles. In uh, Matthew 12, 43 through 45, it says, when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through the waterless places seeking rest and does not find it. And then it says, I will return to my house for when it comes it will find it unoccupied swept and put in order and then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself and they go in and live there and the last state of that man becomes worse than the first if that is the way it will also be with this evil generation and so instead of focusing on spectacular signs and wonders christ addresses their need for salvation and many people appear even religious people they appear to have their lives all in 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 line and in order and it's all a facade and christ knows he sees the true condition of the heart of man um, and that they might not have trusted in christ as lord and savior uh, their souls are unoccupied that is the holy spirit does not indwell them uh, they're open to demonic invasion and uh, they might even have emptied themselves and become a tool and a device uh, and an agent of satan through automatic writing and uh, that is wickedness and that is abhorrent to the god of the bible and so that that cannot be true of those who are indwelt by um 
and whose bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, as we considered from 2 Corinthians 6.16. And according to 1 Peter 1.5, when Christ reigns in a person's life, that person is kept by the power of God. That's the point of Romans, by the way, Romans 8.31-39. through It repeatedly, four or five times, tells us we are kept by the power of God. And so as a result, the evil one does not touch him, as 1 John 5.18 says. And so lastly, one last thought. When the Holy Spirit inhabits a person, no demon can set up a house as a squatter. Uh, and dwelling by demons is evidence of a lack of genuine biblical salvation. So it's possible for unbelievers to be possessed by demons, but not those who've been indwelt by the Holy Spirit through their faith and their trust in Jesus and the grace and mercy of God in their salvation. Amen. But believers can be oppressed, or it's an old-fashioned word, obsessed by demons. So you could have demons around you causing havoc. That's spiritual warfare, right? That's different than possession. Yeah, exactly. We That's why we're to take up the armor of God. And by the way, it's interesting um, in Ephesians 6, one thing that we often miss about that passage, we always focus on, you know, either praying or whatever. But it, actually, the only reason that we can put on the armor, Paul says in that passage, is that we're in Christ. It's, we're in him. We're in the Lord. And it's really interesting because that's something that's often missed in teaching on that particular subject. And the language is, is that we are hit. The language of in Christ, in him, in the Lord is that we belong to him. He is ours and we are his. And so that is hugely significant. That means that we can take up the armor of God because we have one who, as the Bible tells us very clearly, he is a warrior and he goes before us and um, he's already won. We know the victory we can stand as First Corinthians 15 tells us, you know, in the grace and knowledge of our of our Lord and which we're second uh, Peter 318 tells us to grow in the grace and knowledge of God. And so all this means uh, uh, even even in First Peter 5 um verse 6 before he says in verse 7 to cast your cares on the lord he says that we're to humble ourselves before under under god's mighty hand and then as a result of doing that cast our cares on the lord and so in the midst of spiritual warfare we can we are in him we're in the lord we're in christ uh, we can trust him we're his he is ours and so that's that we fight not from a place of defeat but actually a place of great strength and 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 uh, victory not because of ourselves not because we're sufficient but because christ is is sufficient and it's christ in us christ through us it's it's always about christ um and so he's we we trust him and so that's that's really really good news you know your lord is there to help you in the midst of your anxiety discouragement depression grief bitterness doubt questions and on and on he's going to help you um, the question is are you going to call on him for that help that he provides and by the way ephesians 1 just one more thought <laughs> the ephesians 1 is actually one long sentence in the greek and there paul tells us that the grace of god super abounds to us it abounds and abounds and abounds and that doesn't mean that you get to live however you want to live it means that you're putting your sin to death as uh romans 6 11 tells you to consider yourself dead to sin and alive to god uh, th through christ um this is what the holy spirit's helping you to do you do that by putting on christ putting on him putting off the flesh putting the sin to death through the means of grace with the help of the holy spirit um when so when you have those thoughts of lust or temptation or discouragement or whatever your bible read your bible uh, take every thought captive into the obedience of christ second corinthians 10 5 and uh, the lord will help you thank you so much for helping us with this issue dave we really appreciate your time the conversation got so deep so strong so passionate that at one point, I said to my cousin, I'm going to say something, and this is going to be wild, but because you believe that we can be possessed, controlled by unclean spirit as born-again believers, I'm going to say something wild to you, cuz. I says, I'm standing outside, and I'm looking up in the sky right now, 
And I'm going to say to Father God right now, as I'm looking into the sky, Father, if me, if a born again Christian who believes in you, our Lord and Savior, can be demon possessed, then the blood of Jesus is not stronger than Satan. When I said this, my cousin, she fired back at me and said, Repent cause, don't say that. Don't talk like that. Mighty God. And I'm like, no, no, I'm not going to repent. Not going to repent. Because if the blood of Jesus cannot keep me from being demon possessed, then it's facts. Then his blood ain't strong. His power is not stronger than the devil. But we know that that's not the case because we know that Jesus is Lord. And his power supersedes that of every demon and Satan. So that being said, no. We cannot be demon-possessed as people of God. We can be oppressed. Well, she told me I need to go back and pray to Father God, seek more understanding and discernment. And, you know, she felt that I was unlearned. You know, I never said those things to her, but okay, I took it. And um, here we are. So now let's deal with the next topic that Naja had brought up and was teaching in this class and teaches in general, period, on her platform. And that's about generational curses in the bloodline. I cast demons out of Christians all the time. Now, when I first heard her say this, I was taken aback. I was like, what? You cast demons, unclean spirits, out of a born-again Christian all the time. Do you know how much all the time is? All the time. And I said, no, there's no way. There's no way that that person, he or she, is truly born again. And so we have to unpack this and find out what is happening here. And so now, hopefully, you're beginning to understand why I said to my cousin that the power of Jesus, the power of the blood of Jesus, isn't stronger than the power of Satan if we have to keep getting delivered and delivered. Something is wrong. And we know that Jesus isn't wrong. So it must be the teachings of nausea that is wrong. Let's continue to unpack. Now you will find, and I'm turning over now to the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah lived at the time the northern kingdom went into captivity, and he warned the southern kingdom that it was going to happen to them. And one of the things, again, that God condemned them for was this matter of, of turning to the underworld, to turning to the occult, to turning to that which is satanic rather than turning to God. I am now going to Isaiah, the 8th chapter, and I'd like to read a couple of verses here, beginning with 19. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep. They talk in tongues. And that mutter, they talk in tongues. Should not a people seek under their God for the living to the dead, to the law and to the testimony? If they speak not according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. Now, God said to his people this. He said, should a people turn to the underworld when you have a revelation from God? Turn to the word of God. And God says, turn to me. Directly. 
And may I say it very kindly. God wants us to turn to him directly and not to any miracle worker today or any human being. And one thing, the, I think the, the problem is that people say, well, how can a Christian have a demon if you are a believer in Christ? The Holy Spirit dwells in our spirit. These demons inhabit our soul and our body, our flesh. They're not in the same place. Okay. And so because of that, when we become a Christian, it doesn't immediately cancel out demons that may have come in through our bloodline. It doesn't immediately cancel out and they just leave just as soon as we come into agreement with being a Christian. When we were being a hellion the rest of our life before that. So your soul is not saved at the new birth, nor is your body when you become born again. They are both still open to demonic attacks and affliction, which is why once you become saved, you still have to do things to make sure you keep those doors closed or they will still come in. Okay. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Okay. So it takes time and it takes obedience to the word of God for the soul to be saved. So the body can remain oppressed by the devil. So you must actually go through the process of getting delivered now renouncing and repenting is definitely things that you need to do renouncing and denouncing is what cancels the agreement in the spirit it cancels the agreement but it does not force the demon to leave so you still need deliverance now you can do deliverance yourself and some people don't really have the faith to do deliverance which is why God has appointed certain people to assist in doing that. Just make sure you never pay somebody to do deliverance. We should not be paying for prayer, paying for deliverance. Deliverance should be free. Now, what she says right here is interesting because she's telling us what isn't free, what should not be charged for. But if you want to counsel, counseling from her, that has a price. And so the only reason why I know that there's a price tag to pay if you want counseling from her is because she advertises it very often. It's on her website and whenever she comes on on one of her social media platforms, she reminds folks to sign up for one of her counseling and, you know, whatever have you, um, which I've said this in times past before, um, the Holy Spirit. He's our Christian counselor, you know? Now, can you seek counseling from a godly person? Yeah, you can seek advice. You can seek some counseling. But to go out and get a certification that says, well, I am licensed to counsel Christians and I'm a Christian counselor, I look at that as you're a life coach. You're just a motivational speaking life coach. All right, guys, so I want to first start off by thanking everyone who has um, signed up for the one-on-one -on -one and consults and coaching. For those of you who do not know, I am offering one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions, okay? For those people who feel like they need hands-on direction on how to move away from toxic practices and mindsets, and how to allow the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to transform you. Pretty much the same thing that I did in order to move away from New Age. See, I don't think you heard her, so let me help you out here. She's basically saying the same thing that I'm saying. To allow the Holy Spirit, turn to the Holy Spirit, whom we as Christian born again, believers of Jesus Christ, we now have a relationship with him. He indwells in us. Okay, so why do I need to come to you for Christian counseling when I have the Holy Spirit and I have the word of God? Okay, nothing is wrong with, you know, having a conversation with a believer in, in the body of Christ. And we just we're, we're fellowshipping. But to now counsel me, because you're saying you're partnering with the Holy Spirit, 
where they do that at? That's not that's not what happened with Apostle Paul and Apostle Peter. No, that's not how this works. In order to end up where I am now, which always we are growing. We are never perfect. But I am now an ordained evangelist and I have dedicated my life towards assisting in bringing people out of darkness and showing them the right way, which is Jesus Christ. So please visit my website, NajaAlson.com and check out what we have to offer. Anybody who is looking for um, an accountability partner, you know that you would like to have a close relationship with God um, or you just feel stuck and you need to pick me up. I definitely am the one to reach out to. So visit my website today, NajaAlston.com, where you can definitely um, sign up for a consult first. That way I know exactly what you're working with and whether or not we're a good fit. Um, that's the best way to go about reaching out with any form of coaching or doctor or whatever it is. You want to make sure that that person can give you what you need before signing up for a month or whatever the case may be. So. Yes, guys, head on over to NajaAlson.com, sign up for a console. I'll be. Uh, no, I don't need you. I need the Holy Spirit of God. I'll be looking forward to seeing you. If you have not already, please go ahead and visit the Amazon link, which is in the description, and purchase your deliverance journal. If you have not purchased your deliverance journal, please go ahead, head over. The link is in the description so you can get your deliverance journal. This is gonna help you keep track of everything that you're going through, the process that you have maybe even already gone through and to keep track of that so that you can have all of the experiences put together and knowing exactly what it was that helped you so that you can begin to help someone else and you can also begin to freeform write um, your experiences so that you can begin to put that in a book for yourself, okay? It's time for all of us. If you have a testimony, it's time to put it in writing. It's time to put it in a book. All right, guys. Now back to the topic of deliverance. Okay. But that process can come from fasting and praying alone. Just you and God. It's the Holy Spirit that's doing it anyway. Even if I'm the one that's doing deliverance, you it's me and you partnering with the Holy Spirit for that to get done. It's not me. It's the Holy Spirit. Okay, um, the same way that Jesus delivered many from demonic oppressions in the body and soul. For example, the woman with the spirit of infirmity for 18 years in Luke 13, 11 through 13. Jesus delivered many from disease by Apostle Paul. And these diseases were caused by demons. Diseases like schizophrenia, diseases like cancer. The cancer is definitely a, um, it's more of a generational curse and so when i heard her say this i was like stop right there so if i had a wig that i could flip i would have flipped my wig she is asserting and teaching that all sicknesses and disease and infirmities are from the devil are from demons and i said what you're wrong how dare you make such bold claim how could you say that but we're gonna get into that oh i got something for you yes i do because what she said right there is so dangerous and dangerously erroneous it's very sad and it needs to be addressed Yes, we're not going to ignore that. We're not going to let that slide. And we're not drinking that Kool-Aid either. And so, yeah, that really upset me. It really upset me. That I went back into the scripture. I said, no, mm -mm, no. Because I, I know that it was because of disobedience Adam and Eve fell, okay? The fall of man is because of disobedience. They, shouldn't, they should not have eaten from that tree. 
of knowledge of good and evil. And that entered, that ushered in, I should say, the curse, curses of sin. Sin is a curse. And because of that one disobedience, here we are in a sinful world, broken world, in our sinful nature and condition. And we needed the cleansing, purified blood of Jesus that is perfect, that could rescue us, cleanse us, heal us, save us, and break the curse of sin. And she's up here teaching that all sicknesses, disease, and infirmities are from the devil. That is demonic. That is wrong. Now listen, here's the thing. Jesus gave us examples that Satan can bound a person um, physically, you know, a person can be ill, a person can be sick, you know, demons can afflict you, you know, with, with sicknesses and illnesses and so forth, right? But that's not always the case for everybody. So when she's, when she's making this statement, it's a broad brush, ignorant statement, you know, um, you had that, remember you had the, the, the young man who was, was blind. And the disciples of Christ asked him, well, who sinned? Was it him or, or his parents? Why he's suffering from his blindness? And Jesus says, it has nothing to do with that. But for the glory of God, you know, what I'm going to do is going to glorify, you know, um, Father God. So, you know, so I'm not canceling out that no... Satan is not involved in the sickness business. Oh, he is, but he is not the sole purpose of all of them. You know, there are children that are born with all different kind of sicknesses and cancers and, you know, um, illnesses and strange, strange abnormalities. A lot of these things are unexplainable. We don't really know. But and so because we don't know doesn't mean you should go ahead and, yeah, man, a Satan fault. For everything no don't do that okay why you see so many people that have cancer that started with one family member goes to the next and the next and the next that's a generational curse and so it's inflammation all right and so a lot of people will say well why would god allow his children to suffer under satan's yoke and this goes back to what I said earlier. God allows this because he is a just God. All right. He does only what is right. The devil has no power outside of what God allows. He is not a wicked God. He's not. He's not going to unleash punishment unjustly on his children. Many Christians suffer at the hands of the devil because of evil covenants and curses in their families or their lives. God respects covenants. He's a righteous God. Covenants are formal agreements, okay? And that are legally binding, whether in heaven or on earth, whether spiritual or physical, okay? So they stay in force from one generation to the next until someone actually breaks those covenants. So again, you will see people that even if they've been unsaved their whole life and they get saved literally two days before they die those covenants are still in intact they still have to be broken so they have still passed on to the next generation until there are certain things that are actually prayed specific things that are targeted that are prayed to cancel those things one book i will definitely recommend to you guys that will give you so much knowledge in those areas and I'm going to pull that up for you so that I make sure I give you the right one. And then I'll open the uh, floor for some questions. And the name of it is um, Deliverance for, from Demonic Covenants and Curses. Okay, Deliverance from Demonic Covenants and Curses. And that is by Reverend James A. Solomon. So when I heard her mention this guy's name, I said to myself, 
I've heard this name before from somebody else. And I had to scan my memory banks. And then I said, ah, I remember where I heard him from. Let me show you. So remember when I said in the early beginnings of this video that birds of the same feather flock together? Yeah, because I said, I I've heard this name before. And then I remembered, this is where I heard the name from. From Tiffany Montgomery. Oh, which by the way, about Tiffany Montgomery. So then I was like, wait a minute, Tiffany Montgomery? Mr. Solomon? And then I saw this. I saw that she put this as her thumbnail on the one of our videos, which is right here, right? And like she said, she was going to link that message that Tiffany shared. And I was like, <laughs> birds of the feather. You know what's funny about that? I keep on mentioning birds of the feather. Is that I'm actually sitting in my vehicle under a tree and these birds are just just talking to each other they just talking to each other just singing and singing away right singing sweet songs of melodies pure and true singing this is my message to you Say I don't worry. Yeah, 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 you know? Because <laughs> I'm like, yo, these birds are really loud while I'm trying to, you know, make this audio here. So I just wanted you to see it real quick, just in case you're wondering. Yo, he's mentioning birds of the feather, and then I'm hearing birds, really, chirping away. Well, this is why. All right, back to the video. So about Tiffany Montgomery, right? The only reason why I know of her is because she, you know, has something to say about all those professing Christians who were attending Beyonce's concert way back when. And so that made a lot of noise. I made the rounds on all social media. And that's how come I've become aware of her. And then that was the end of it. I, you know, just, okay, fine, whatever. I didn't need her to tell me that. And I don't know which Christian needed her to tell them that, that going to that woman's concert, you know, was, was something that a child of God should not partaking I, I don't i don't i don't understand did we really needed a christian to tell another christian that if you have the holy spirit in you right if you if you're walking with the lord i don't need to tell you that but i digress let me calm down so i, I didn't see the hype behind her and so my blood sister see him father see him mother shared a video of tiffany that um she was, you know, being interviewed by these two guys these, on, on one of their on, on one of their shows on a podcast. And this this was like um, a, a three hour conversation, sit down with her. And I gave it 47 minutes. And in the first 47 minutes, which I felt was way too much anyway, because she was saying a lot of things that was wrong as well. And that was erroneous as well. And I mentioned that to my sister. And, you know, I said, hey, this woman is a false prophet. I don't, I don't trust her. I'm not buying it. I don't believe in her. And I was trying to let my sister know to be careful. And my sister took it like really personal, really personal as if I was, you know, coming at her. And so then, you know, that, that, that became, um, you know, a, 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 another drama. And then I was like, you know what, who is this young lady? And so I decided, you know, let me, let me, let me really get an understanding of who she is and what is she's about, what is she's talking about. And I found some stuff. Hey guys, Matt here. Welcome to Learn to Discern. Today, we are going to be assessing a prophetic word and some teaching from Tiffany Montgomery. But first, if you'd like to help promote Christian content here on YouTube, please go ahead and take a second now to subscribe to my channel and thank you in advance. Okay guys, as you can see from where I highlighted on the screen, this video was originally posted back in October of 2023. This is a prophetic word from Tiffany Montgomery. The title of the video, your new season is called The Winning Streak. So this is supposed to be a prophetic word for the last quarter of 2023. And obviously it's a pretty positive prophetic word. So let's give it a listen and we'll just see how it goes. 
what does that mean for you? Obviously, there are four quarters in a year. And so we're currently in the fourth quarter, which means that it does not matter how slow, how delayed, how behind the second and the third quarter was. It has nothing to do with what God is getting ready to do for you in the fourth quarter of the year. So we already know that, right? Um, but this is the word I wanted to release over you. And I'm coming today as a prophet of God to release over your season that we are in a brand new season. We're in a brand new season. And here's what's powerful about a brand new season. And many of you have heard me say this before, but most people wait for the season to meet them, right? Like we wait for winter to come. We wait for fall to come. We wait for spring to come. We wait for summer to come. But how many of you know in the kingdom that we're a part of, assuming that you're a believer like I am, our new season isn't seen, it's proclaimed, right? Our new season. Okay, so she says that for believers, your new season is not seen, it is proclaimed. And so, by the way, when she talks about seasons, she's really not talking about winter, spring, summer, fall. She's saying a season would be a period of time where God is doing something new in your life. And we see from the title of the video, she's saying this new season that you're about to be in, we're going to proclaim this new season. We're going to bring it about, and it's going to be all about the winning streak. You can probably see where that's going to go, right? It's positive things, positive outcomes are going to keep taking place in your life. Now, if I were to ask you, where is the passage of scripture that teaches that we as believers proclaim our new season? Could you come up with one? The answer should be no, because there is nothing in scripture that actually teaches this. As we are going to see in a second, Tiffany Montgomery is going to attempt to use a passage of scripture, but it, it fails uh, very, very significantly in terms of how accurate it is biblically. Let's take a listen. Season is not something we wait and see. It's something we declare out of our mouth. Well, Tiffany, give me scripture for that. Cool. First Kings 18, right? We have a time where prophet Elijah was fighting all the prophets of Baal. There was drought. It had not rained for three and a half years. You know, the season was, it was a drought season. And after he won the war, he then declared a new season by saying, I hear the sound. There is a sound of the abundance of rain. He didn't wait for the new season to come like most of us Christians do. He didn't say, well, it'll happen in God's timing and we'll just wait for it to come. No, he took his authority um, as a prophet of God to declare over it and says, there's a sound of an abundance of rain. How did he know that the new season had ended? Because his worship won the war. Okay, so let's just focus on what she said there. She says that 1 Kings 18 teaches us that Elijah, she said, took his authority as a prophet of God to declare the new season. He didn't wait for God to tell him. He didn't wait for circumstances. No, he declared it. And basically he brought this thing about. Now I would point out to you, if you read the entirety of this story in Ezekiel or sorry, excuse me, with Elijah in first Kings uh, chapter 18, you will see that Elijah is following the directions of the Lord throughout his ministry. That's what a true prophet does. A true prophet does not speak uh, what they desire to have come about and then expect God to fulfill it. In fact, one of the signs for a false prophet, as mentioned in Jeremiah, is that a false prophet is somebody who is just speaking out of their own heart. A true prophet is somebody who only says what God is saying to them. So this is ridiculous to say that Elijah just recognized that it was time to shift the season and he prophetically declared it. And as soon as he pronounced it, it came about. No. If that were the case, then how come Elijah waited for the three and a half years? If he had this prophetic authority to just do it at any time, why wouldn't he do it beforehand? Did he get some sort of pleasure of just watching everybody uh, endure the drought? No, the drought came about because of the people's wickedness and God was bringing it about. So Elijah could not make this prophetic announcement until God told him to, until God prompted him to do so. So this is not in any way, shape or form teaching that you can somehow just speak and declare what new season you want to have happen and God will bring it about. In fact, that is how you create false prophets. All right, let's continue. I want everybody to write that down. Worship wins wars, okay? Worship wins wars. There's many. First Kings 18 teaches that worship wins war. I, guys, I, I don't think so. I mean, it's good to worship God. It's good to worship God, but does that win wars? No. Many different ways to worship God. Most of us think that it's just in song and dance and rejoicing and all of that is powerful. But it's all worship also, the word worship was actually a picture language. You know, all these words that we use today were actually picture languages, which means that worship was in the picture of an arch, a archer. Is that what it's called? An archer? Um, the bow and arrow people? An archer. It was actually in the symbol of that. It was a war symbol that they used 
the word worship for because all of these languages started off in a picture language. And so him going to war um, against the kingdom of darkness was actually worship to God. So the war that prophet Elijah won in first Kings 18 was won by worship. Okay. And after he won the war, he didn't wait for the new season to meet him. He didn't say, I won the war and I'm just going to wait for God to do his thing. No, what he said was now there is a sound of an abundance of rain. We've been in three and a half years of drought. This is now going to be rainy season. Okay. We know in the book of, uh, I think it's James. Okay. So again, she's saying that Elijah just took his authority and declared it. Now, we're going to see, I'm going to skip ahead here in a second. I hope I can get to the right time where she's going to start speaking, I guess, about uh, your new season, what's going to happen for you. But again, Elijah was not just saying whatever he wanted to have happen. Elijah was speaking what God said to her and so uh, said to him. And so now Tiffany Montgomery is saying that she is a prophet and she is releasing this prophetic word. And you can see the new season is supposed to be all about the winning streak. So let's listen to some of the things that she says are supposed to take place. And remember, this was for the the last few months of 2023. And let's just see, let's test this prophecy to see if it came true. When he declared that it would not rain for three and a half years, it didn't rain. And when he declared again that it would rain for three and a half years, it rained again. And so I'm going to say it again. Our new season, your new season is not seen with your eyes. It is proclaimed out of your mouth. And I'm coming to you today before I get off as a prophet of God to declare a new season over your life in this fourth quarter. Your new season has a name and it has a theme. And the name of your new season is the winning streak. I want somebody to write that down. The name of your new season is called the winning streak. All of this um, failure at the edge of breakthrough, all of this, you're dating somebody and everything, you know, goes downhill right when things are getting ready to be beautiful. You know, you're at the edge of a promotion and all of a sudden something happens and it knocks it out of your hands. Like all of these things, most of you have things in your life that have been aborted. Um okay, so let's just stop right there. I mean, you can see where she's going. You've felt like you were at the edge of breakthrough. You were about to get your promotion. You were about to find the right person for you and it didn't happen. Well, now she is declaring she is using this biblical model she would say to declare this new season and she is going to bring it about so let's just test this prophetic word if you follow tiffany montgomery and you think she's a great woman of god let me ask you in the last three months of 2023 would you characterize it as the winning streak did you get the promotion did the relationship that needed to be mended, did it get mended? Did you get your financial breakthrough? She eventually is going to go on to talk about people writing books. I mean, was it just win after win after win after win after win after win? Everything you've been waiting for. It just came true. The answer is no. Now, you may have had something good happen, but that would be pretty much any period. If you looked at any three-month period of my life, I could tell you something good happened and probably something bad happened. So, if you would not say that 2023, the end of it was the winning streak and I got the breakthrough and the promotion. And one of the ways that we know that is if you actually look to the uh, the right part of the screen, which hopefully you can see this, hopefully for, for 2024, this is your record breaking year. What to do when all hell breaks loose? Why are you still having to talk about it? They were supposed to be on the winning streak. Why hell is breaking loose now? Did you declare that season, Tiffany Montgomery? You must have declared that hell was going to break loose. Because that's how seasons change, right? So why did you do that, Tiffany? Guys, this teaching is not biblical. This did not happen. Tiffany Montgomery is a false prophet. I've listened to a lot of her teaching. She, it's horrific, guys. I mean, the, the woman has no idea what the Bible actually says. She's uh, teaching a lot of things that can be found in New Age. And in fact, I watched a video just a few minutes ago before I recorded this where she was like, this is not New Age, Law of Attraction. I'm listening to it. I'm like, this is new age. This is law of attraction. It absolutely is. So she is somebody who is to be avoided in ministry. So in this video of hers where she linked Tiffany's so-called prophetic word from God in her video, she's trying to say and, and draw a parallel that God has also spoken to her and said the same things to her that he shared with Tiffany, that Tiffany shared with the body of Christ. And trying to say that she too is a watchman on the wall. But then when you ask her if she's a prophetess she says she's not a prophetess she Naja. and so but then she she functions and moves in the office of a prophetess but she's going to tell you she's an evangelist my this is one thing i want to say my goal because there is so much that is going around there is so much word that's being spoken and one thing and i have said this many times i do not proclaim to be a prophet okay do i believe that the lord gives me 
word in my study time every time I study that he knows I will share that will uplift or bring revelation to someone else absolutely because every time we open that Bible we know that the word is a living word right and so because it's a living word it is giving opportunity for our father Abba to speak to us to reveal to us what's on his heart and he will do it even more when he knows that the person is going to be open and willing to be used okay we are all as a body of Christ have a responsibility to in some shape or form to evangelize okay we all have a ministry or should anyway that being said you know the Lord will may have had you reading in your word the beginning of that morning and then while you're at work led you to share what he revealed to you that could be taking place in somebody else's life so um, I I do not play around with being I don't like the idea of calling myself a prophetess calling myself a prophet does the Lord speak to me prophetically yes Welcome back to my channel so I am here unexpectedly um, to give a word um, actually meant to do this this morning um, but the Lord had me to re-record it and it's had I've had a busy busy day so I'm back to re-record this message. This is a very different message for me. And I will explain why. I will explain the confirmations that God gave me. And um, as you saw by the title, this is for someone very specific, a specific name. So if your name is Olivia, this message is for you, okay? The Lord has never given me a message um, specifically like this by giving me a name, okay? And... That's why I had to, I guess that's why he had to, you know, confirm it with me a few times before I would really see, okay, yeah, you are saying something about this particular person. So let me just stop and listen. I keep going back to Numbers 2319. He is not a man that he should lie. So whatever it is that he has told you, whatever it is that has been on your spirit that you feel that he said he is going to do, he is not a man that he should lie, nor a man that he should repent. Okay, endure with patience. So I pray that this word reaches the person that it is for. I know that it will because God has said um, to come and do this. So I will also put this video up on um, on TikTok so that um, Olivia, hopefully you will find this. If you would like to reach out to me to confirm that this word is for you and you don't want to leave a comment, then that is totally fine. You can do so on my website. NajaAlston.com, which will be in the description, or if this is on TikTok, you can send me a private message. All right. I love you guys. And for those of you who will like to intercede on behalf of Olivia, we do. Um, that's what we should be doing as a body. Okay. Send prayers her way. Send guidance her way. Send peace and love in her direction through your prayers. All right, guys. Love you. Guys. Okay. And so when I come and bring this information to you, um, it's because the Lord desires for what has been brought forth to be spoken to uplift someone else who just may be having that same situation that he spoke to me in my study time. So basically, you said all that to say that you are a mouthpiece, a messenger speaking the oracles of God. So you're a prophetess, but you just don't want to admit to that because you understand the weight that it has, the penalty that comes with it for speaking for God when he never sent you. Because you would be labeled a false prophetess, which, Naja, you are. To, uh, and that's why we always say test the spirit to make sure that, first of all, anything I give you is scripture, but you still want to test the spirit 
to make sure that this is a word that is for you, that it's something that the Lord presented for you, okay, for the season and the time that you are in, all right? And the reason I'm saying this is because there are so many, and I said this on TikTok, there are so many people that are popping up all over the place and giving themselves the title of prophetess and prophet. And when you actually stop to listen to what they're saying and, and really dissect what they're saying based on the word of God, based on scripture, based on how we know the Holy Spirit moves, you will quickly see that there are some, they will give you, they will give you things that will make you say, oh wow, she's, you know, she's speaking the truth because she's teaching against idolatry. She's teaching against uh, witchcraft. She's teaching against this. But then you hear something very small and simple, like the person asking for you to send them a picture of you and your family that they're asking for prayer. So if and so I'm not, I'm not going to play the rest of that part out about the whole picture thing. And she feels that they just going to put it on her altar because that's pretty much what she's going to say and where that's going with that is that, oh, they sound good at first and everything was sounding, you know, like it's really from the Lord until they say some something weird. They start to request some weird stuff that's not from the Lord. So pretty much that's what she's saying next. So I just cut out that part. And I do believe that there are some people who may also have a desire to speak the truth, um, you know, God's word, but yet they maybe are just not as educated as they should be before speaking. Okay. We all make mistakes. We may say something that may not be all the way right. So that's why you have to pray and test the spirit because the person may be operating through the Holy Spirit and just was uneducated about a topic they spoke on, okay? So allow the Holy Spirit to confirm if a person is false or if they are just uneducated in what they're speaking about, because that can also happen, okay? But I don't ever want people to come to my page, hear my, the word that I'm sharing, and think that I'm coming to you um, as a prophet. I'm sharing what the Lord revealed to me in my study time because I go before him asking for him to reveal what's on his heart and study and read the word and I come share it knowing that the Lord has someone in mind who it might be for. Okay? Now that that... Oh, and let me say this. Stop asking people to say the person's name. Okay? It has nothing to do with someone revealing and exposing a person's name. What it's about is assisting the body of Christ with being able to recognize and learn how to discern. Because if it's not that person, I could give somebody's name and you may say, okay, I'm going to stop following this person or listening to this person. But if you have not learned, okay, as a um, believer, how to discern, how to test the spirit, then it will just be somebody else that you'll fall victim to. Does that make sense? So this is about teaching you how to discern, not coming to just tell you about one particular person or two people or whoever. So stop asking people to give a name. Okay, that's just you being messy and that's just you desiring to create mess. Um, no, see now this sounds personal. Um, no, that's actually doing the right thing. You're trying to find out and learn, well, who is who? Who do I need to be? Um, mindful of, right? Because there's a lot of wolves in sheep clothing. There's a lot of charlatans, right? And so 
That's like going down to the precinct and you're giving a report. They're going to ask you, well, who was it? You know, who, who are we talking about? Do you have a name? Do you have a description? Are you going to look them in the face and say, oh, I ain't got a name for you. I don't have a description for you. You got to use a discernment, Mr. Officer, Miss Officer. Come on now. Come on now. Don't insult us. Don't insult our intelligence. So let's take a look at the biblical definition of a watchman then. And let's see. So I'm reading from GodQuestions.org. And the topic is watchmen. So here it is. The Bible also refers to watchmen in a spiritual sense. God appointed prophets as spiritual watchmen over the souls of his people. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. Ezekiel chapter 33 verse 7. Also Hosea chapter 9 verse 8. The prophet's job, the who? Prophet's job as a watchman, as a what? Watchman, was to urge God's people to live faithfully and warn them of the perils involved in falling away from the Lord and doing evil. As watchmen, the prophets were also called to warn wicked people of the judgment and destruction that would come their way unless they turned from their evil ways. Israel's spiritual watchmen bore a heavy responsibility before the Lord. If a prophet failed to warn others as God had appointed him to do, his own life was in danger and he would be held accountable for the people's sin. Son of man, speak to your people and say to them, When I bring the sword against the land and the people of the land choose one of their men and make him their watchman, and he sees the sword coming against the land and blows the trumpet to warn the people, then if anyone hears the trumpet but does not heed the warning and the sword comes and takes their life, their blood will be on their own head. Since they heard the sound of the trumpet but did not heed the warning, their blood will be on their own head. If they had heeded the warning, they would have saved themselves. But if a watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet to warn the people and the sword comes and takes someone's life, that person's life will be taken because of their sin. But I will hold the watchman accountable for their blood. Ezekiel chapter 33 verses 2 through 6. And... There's, there's lots more um, to be, two more paragraphs to be read, but I'm not going to get into it. You get the gist of it. And so as I read that, which just, I'm reading this for the first time, it reminds me of Tiffany Montgomery says this quite often. She echoes a lot of what I just read out of Ezekiel. Hey, I warned you. That ain't on my end. Hey, the blood ain't on my end. I told you. You know, you, you know, and then she go on and she go on and she go on. Okay. All right, that's nice and all. If you were really, truly a prophet of God, if you really were, if y'all really were prophets of God, because first of all, you cannot make a mistake, you cannot make an error as a prophet of God. And these people have, Naja has made claims that has not been accurate. Tiffany has made claims that has not been accurate accurate and all it takes is for just one inaccuracy of thus saith the lord and you are disqualified so today guys we're going to just be having a discussion discussion about something that um the lord spoke to my spirit to speak against and to um, come into agreement with a word that he gave to our sister prophetess tiffany montgomery now, um, before she, I don't know if you've seen the video, if you haven't, I will link it in the description of this video. Um, her video is basically a warning to believers in regards to false prophets. And as a watchman, as she is, I as well am a watchman. I felt uh, the Holy Spirit before she even mentioned that we should be teaching this, that he was saying, I want you to, to, to speak about this. 
And so out of obedience, what I am doing is going to um, just kind of talk about an array of different things and how they have started to infiltrate um, the church and how they have crept into the church, some ignorantly and others intentionally. So, for example, we have two categories. We have churches that are not educating themselves on the dangers of how the enemy is operating in this season, which is just as dangerous as anything else, because in order for you to understand how to properly move, you need to understand what is happening, um, what the enemy's tactics are in order to protect your congregation and to also teach your congregation how to stay abreast. I'm sorry, I just need to interject because see, I'm so tired of this. You know, it's, it's always some kind of a season with these people. It's always some kind of a season, right? And here she's trying to tell us that she and Tiffany were both given a, a word from the Lord that, listen, the church needs to know how the devil is moving in this season. Satan's mission statement has not changed. Here, let me show you. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. We're told to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Oh, wait. If that's not good enough for you, no problem. Let's jump on over to... Um, let's go to John 8. 44. What did Jesus tell us? He says, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do now. Not us Christians, not, not us, not us the believers, not us. And he says that uh, he was a murderer. He, Satan, was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he's a liar and the father of it. Now, let's look at John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus again says, the thief, which thief? Who thief? Satan, the devil. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly so you see his mission statement the devil that is has not changed you have no new revelation to give to the body of christ about satan i just remembered revelations 13 we are told about the beast that comes out of the sea right how that beast is going to you know have power and um, we're told later on how, you know, the dragon and the beast is going to come together and create, um, you know, this one, this one being who will have such power, such charisma, um, that he, he, he is the Antichrist. That's the Antichrist. Now, there are many Antichrists today, but the one that's above all of them is to come. Yeah, that's, that's the devil. We, we already know he's going to be operating through that one person, that one man. So his mission statement, again, has not changed. And also in Revelation chapter 20, we are told, um, Apostle John, through the Holy Spirit, how he will be destroyed once and for all. So not only has his mission statement not changed for the body of Christ, Okay, towards us, but his destiny, <laughs> praise be to God, his destiny is still intact. That has not changed and it will not change because he is a defeated foe. Okay, all right, so you and Tiffany and everybody else who got some alleged word about the devil and how the church should move and operate and, and war against Satan. You, you, you're talking, you're talking things, or shall I say it like this, you're false. All of you guys are false.
You're making stuff up. As I'm looking at you in your face, I can see you're making this up. Best of things that are occurring. And then you have the church that is intentionally created for the sake of um, leading people away from God and into a lifestyle of witchcraft. So I wanted to talk about this. And for those of you who are new to my channel and you've never seen me before in, in life, then I would like for you to make sure that you take a look at my testimony, which will be linked in the description as well. My testimony will tell you from start to finish my story um, and how I got extremely caught into a lifestyle of new age and came out of that at in late 2019. Since then, I have gotten into becoming a full-blown evangelist. I am an ordained evangelist, um, but even before becoming ordained, my goal was to do the Lord's work and to speak what he has placed on my heart to speak. Since then, I have written a book, from witchcraft to righteousness. And this is to teach the things that are associated in New Age. And it talks specifically about my story coming out of New Age and bringing light to the things that are associated with darkness. And so you want me to believe that God told you the same thing that he told Tiffany. And Tiffany want me to believe that God told her the same thing that she heard from somebody else. And that somebody else want me to believe God told them the same thing that they heard from somebody else. Come on, man. Come on, man. Stop trying to insult our intelligence. Right? Now, is there word of knowledge prophecy? Does, does God give word of knowledge prophecy yes he does yes he does but i'm going to show you from scripture what it's supposed to look like let's take a look at acts chapter 21 and i'm going to read from verses 1 to 11 and then i'm going to go and look at the kingdom dynamics and so Paul was getting warnings on the journey to Jerusalem. Now it came to pass that when we had departed from them and set sail, running a straight course, we came to Kos, the following day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. Verse 3, when we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left, sailed to Syria, and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to unload her cargo. Verse 4, And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. Okay, so they had a word of knowledge. Okay, verse 5, When we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way, and they all accompanied us with wives and children, till we were out of the city. And we knelt down on the shore and prayed. When we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship, and they returned home. And when we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Petolomias. Pet, yeah, Petolomas. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. Greeted the brethren and stayed with them one day. Verse 8. On the next day, we, who were Paul's companions, um, departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip, the evangelist. Hey, we got a real evangelist over here, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. Verse 9, Now this man had four daughters, virgin daughters, who prophesied. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Verse 11, When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now you're probably wondering, what does this have to do with Naja and Tiffany? 
and the rest of them and the rest of them. What does that have to do with all these so-called prophets and prophetess you're wondering? Let's read the issue of personal prophecy. Prophecy. The Bible clearly allows for personal prophecy. Nathan brought David a confrontive word from God. 2 Samuel chapter 12 verse 13. Isaiah predicted Hezekiah's death. Isaiah chapter 38 verse 1. And in this text, Agabus told Paul he faced trouble in Jerusalem. Personal prophecy refers to a prophecy word. The Holy Spirit may prompt one person to give another, relating to personal matters. Many feel deep reservations about this operation of the gift of prophecy because sometimes it is abused. True words may be used to manipulate others or they may be unwisely or hastily applied. This passage reveals safeguards against abusive uses of personal prophecy, allowing us to implement this biblical practice. First, the word will usually not be new to the mind of the person addressed, but it will confirm something God is already dealing with him about. From Acts chapter 20 verses 22 to 24, we know Paul was already sensitive to the issue Agabus raised. Second, the character of the person bringing the word ought to be weighed. Agabus' credibility is related not to his claim of having a word, but to his record as a trustworthy man of God used in the exercise of this gift. Chapter 11 verse 28 and chapter 21 verse 10. Third, remember that the prophecy or word is not to be considered controlling. In other words, such prophecy should never be perceived as dominating anyone's free will. Christian living is never cultish, governed by omens or the counsel of gurus. Paul did not change his plans because of Agabus' prophecy or because of the urging of others. Verses 12 through 14, he received the word graciously but continued his plans nonetheless. Fourth, all prophecy is in part, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 9, which means that as true as that part may be, it does not give the whole picture. Agabus' word was true, and Paul was bound in Jerusalem, but this only occasioned an opportunity to eventually minister in Rome, Acts chapter 23, verse 11. Finally, in the light of a word, we should prayerfully consider the word as Mary did the shepherd's report. Luke chapter 2 verse 19. A hasty response is never required. Simply wait on God. Okay? We should then move ahead with trust in God. As Hezekiah did. He had been told that he would shortly die. But he prayed instead of merely surrendering to the prophecy... And his life realized its intended length, unshortened by his diseased condition. Occasional personal prophecy is not risky if kept on biblical footings. But neither is it to become the way we plan or direct our lives. Second Peter ch chapter 1 verse 16 through 19 and Acts chapter 11 verse 27 through 30. You can get that on the Audible app. I love to listen to books when I'm doing other things because I get so busy. Sometimes I don't have time to literally sit and just read a book, but to listen to books like this so you can gain the wisdom and knowledge. It even has prayers at the end of it, teaching you how to cancel these curses and these covenants that are, that are made in the spirit. He came from, he's an African. He came out of um, basically having a father who was, in witchcraft who dedicated him into witchcraft and who lived a life that was connected to all of these things and so he has personal knowledge and and it's an amazing um read so yeah no i, I will not be purchasing his book i don't even want to touch that book when i have the word of god and i've got the the author of the word of God, which is the Holy Spirit that dwells in me, right? So, yeah, I'm cool off of that. You know, it's, it's, 
you know, these people, they do this. Cindy Trim has a book, as I told you before, I think I mentioned in the Bibliomancy, Commanding Your Morning. And, um, you know, they all got a book to tell you what God couldn't tell you. And I'm not finna do this, actually. So, ain't no point in me here, so I'm finna just go, cause this ain't me. But, you don't have to take my word for it. So what does the Word of God actually teaches regarding this topic? So uh, this is one of those teachings where, the and, and there's error on both sides. There's some who will deny that there's any kind of generational curses at all. And they'll just say, yeah, it's just consequences, you know, uh, to bad behavior or, or bad examples. But, you know, there's no kind of generational a curse that, you know, is inherited in any way. Uh, and that when the, you know, the Bible doesn't really talk about that. No, the Bible does talk about sin being generational, it being passed down. And the Bible does talk about uh, severe consequences uh, to sin that is passed down. And it's in the scripture. However, guess what? The greater error is on the side of those who teach that, you know, once you come to Christ, you still have to deal with these generational curses now. <laughs> you have to go to a, a deliverance ministry, a church that will deal with, make you know, have you renounce all the sins of your parents, you know, any sins you could identify. And then recognize that you have... You're possessed by perhaps a spirit of, of pride or a demon of lust or a demon of pornography or a demon of anger or a demon of, you know, I mean, ad agnosium, X, yeah. Y, Z. You know, it just goes on forever and ever. And I've, I said I, I got a hold of a book called Pigs in a Parlor years ago. And somebody gave me a bunch of their books. And that's always interesting. And this little tiny book, man, it had all these pictures, all these, you know, stick figures, pretty much. Uh, people with their arms crossed. And this was a spirit of pride. And it had like, I don't know, 25, 30, I don't know how many pictures. It was just crazy. And it was like, didn't matter what position you're in, you have some spirit in you, you know, <laughs> yeah. however you're standing, you know. And I thought, and this is how this person identified people being possessed by different spirits, Christians. And these Christians, quote unquote, will go to these deliverance ministries and then they'll have bags, you know, and they'll, they'll like throw up these demons into these bags, supposedly spit up the, you know, the barfing into these bags. Barf bags, and that's how they're supposed to get rid of their demons. Uh, by the way, is what in Acts what chapter we read that? I don't think we do. You know, and you yeah, know, didn't you notice? You know, with the eunuch there, you know, in Philip, he's like, make sure you vomit out your your yeah, demons right and, yeah. before we baptize you. Yeah, that's in Acts chapter thirty one or something. You know, it doesn't <laughs> yeah, exist, right? So, really heartbreaking stuff because what happens is people start getting involved in this, and they start a lot of bad things happen. So they're like, Terrible, man, I'm yeah. under these generational curses and. I just saw somebody recently online on YouTube thanking a deliverance minister because of watching his video, I was able to spit up some demons, you know, Ugh. and so forth. I just thought, what in the world, you know? And this has happened all over the place. It's very popular. Yeah, uh, and they'll, they'll do some weird stuff. Call out on the Archangel Michael. They have him calling yeah. out on angels. We had someone actually during our recent live stream episode, and you guys can check that out on the Good Fight Ministries YouTube channel, but during the live stream, while you were preaching and sharing, I'm reading the comments and writing back to some of these people on there, and they're like, well, I saw a deliverance ministry tell me to call out on the Archangel Michael and to get a crucifix. They're Christian. Don't worry. Yeah, and I'm like, whoa, no, this is because they're of the same spirit. Yeah, and hopefully that person, you know, continues to get into the word. And Amen. Yeah. Hopefully we can hopefully we have explain a godly influence on that person. Yeah, Praise we, God. Sounds like they were newer, you know, in the scripture and, or just, you know, being led astray by someone. But Lord, help that person. And so many, that represents so many people. Yep. And, you know, so what happens is you leave these places thinking that you have residual demons that are taking, taking control of you, causes paranoia, get your eyes fixed on too much infatuation with the devil or his work in your life. And yeah, we're supposed to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. We're supposed to be, you know, aware of the enemy's tactics and so forth. We're supposed to be seeking Jesus, man, not vomiting. It. You know, the Bible doesn't. Self deliverance. Yeah, yeah. The, the scriptures are very clear that, you know, you don't find any scriptures talking about those who are genuine, born again believers being possessed by demons. Mm -mm. You are warned that Christians could fall into apostasy in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and turn from the true Jesus and receive a different spirit. Mm. But that's apostasy. That's not someone who's abiding in Christ, who's trusting Jesus. So it's very, very important to understand that. I mean, it, it, it causes a lot of bad fruit, a lot of hangups. So people become obsessed with, you know, uh, being possessed. And what a tragic thing. You're walking around as a Christian thinking that you're possessed by these different demons. And also it becomes an excuse rather than crucifying their flesh and its affections and desires and, and growing in sanctification and putting off the old man and denying yourself 
and recognizing that you have to take responsibility for your own sin. Uh, it denies human culpability regarding our own sins, our own problems, and we get to blame everything on the devil. You know, oh, it must be a demon of this is in me. It must be a demon. I got to go get this delivered from this demon. And you know, we have fallen natures that we need to consider the old man dead. Paul says to you know crucify the flesh with its affections and desires. Paul talks about not to yield the members of your body as instruments of sin, but as slaves to righteousness. So we have to make decisions. So it really skews the whole process of sanctification up. And it has, there's a lot of problems on a lot of different levels. And it minimizes the incredible work of Christ in the believer. Amen. You know, because Jesus isn't strong enough to deliver you from demons. You know, you have to go to this, this shaman or this deliverance minister. And it's really, really sick when you think about it. But the Bible does indeed, and it's like, okay, what's the biblical way to deal with it? The Bible does indeed deal with uh, curses and so forth. Uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15 through 21, we read, However, if you do not obey the Lord, your God, and do not carefully follow all his commands, by the way, this is given to Israel, okay, context, and decrees I am giving you today, all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. You will be cursed in the city, cursed in the country. Uh, you'll be uh, the basket and your kneading uh, trough will be cursed. Verse 18, the fruit of your womb will be cursed and the crops of your land and the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. You'll be cursed when you come in and cursed when you go out. The Lord will send on you curses, confusion and rebuke and everything you put your hand to until you are destroyed and come to a sudden ruin because of the evil that you have done in forsaking him. Some out apostates here, by the way, Amen. not those who become born again believers. The Lord will plague you with diseases until he has destroyed you from the land that you're entering to possess. So yeah, the Bible does talk about curses and it does talk about those who hate the Lord and uh, their descendants for you know fourth and fifth generation and what have you. Uh, experiencing, as you read in Genesis chapter, or Exodus, Exodus chapter 20, 20 yeah. with the Ten Commandments. And that's all over the scripture. We can't deny it. What's he talking about though? And what's the remedy to that? Exodus 34, 7 says that God quote punishes the children and their children for the sins of the fathers to the third and I'm sorry the third and fourth generation numbers 14 18 we read the Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love thank God he is forgiving Amen iniquity and that. transgression thank you Jesus but he will by no means clear the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation Deuteronomy 5 9 you shall not bow down to them nor serve them these false demon gods for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Jeremiah 32, 18 in the prophets. You shall uh, you show steadfast love to thousands, but you repay the guilt of the fathers to the children after them, O great and mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts. Lamentations 5, 7, they're in exile. You know, and their, their fathers have sinned against yeah. God. Our fathers sin and are no more. Uh, it is we who have borne their iniquities. It's like, wait, they're suffering the consequences, though. And they were in rebellion, too. They needed to repent. In fact, Jeremiah's praying there, and his prayer is not totally, he's like, have you cast us off forever? So it's more of a, you know, a prayer of, of, of wonderment, you know. What's your plan, God? And, Chad, when you read Exodus 25, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Now, it's interesting because visiting there, you know, just the whole thing is, is a pakad, which is in the Hebrew pakad. And it has to do with, you know, God actually visiting and uh, bringing punishment, the verb there, the Hebrew verb there. But it's very interesting what's actually going on. We have, you know, this, these judgments and so forth and, and, and all this happening. But we could quote these verses and walk away and then also extrapolate. That means Christians are possessed by demons. No, it doesn't say that, you know. That means Christians are under this curse. No, it doesn't say that. These are given to Israel, okay? There's some application to fallen humanity, which we'll get into in a minute. But it's important to understand that, uh, by the way, when he repays, visits the iniquity of the fathers of the, on the children to the third and fourth generation, uh, ancient uh, uh, Jewish Targums, okay? The Targums were basically, you know, the Aramaic uh, paraphrases or interpretations, or explanations uh, written in the side columns and so forth, uh, explaining text by the rabbis, and sometimes they're way off, and sometimes they were quite accurate. And uh, a Jewish targum has ungodly fathers and rebellious children. Mm -hmm. So recognize those children. They recognize that the children that would, you know, have those perpetuate problems that, yeah. would, be, would perpetuate it because of their own choices. And that's actually very biblical what they're saying there, because we have a lot of scriptures to support. It's not talking about 
an innocent child that's seeking God and loves God, also he's under these generational curses because his great, great, great grandparents were evil, you know? It's important that we understand that. And you have guys like Derek Prince, very popular teacher through the years, will call people up because you know, they have a demon of alcoholism or they have a demon of, of you know, lust or a demon of cancer and he's going to cast that demon out. Can you imagine being told that you have a demon of leukemia? And you're like, wow, oh, I have leukemia, it must be a demon. You go up there and he prays for you and says the demon of leukemia is out. Then you stop your chemotherapy, you stop whatever because I've been delivered. Uh, and then you die, you know? So these, there's incredible consequences. Wrong doctrine leads to wrong living and wrong choices and even death and hell ultimately if they're damnable heresies, right? So what's the, what's the biblical response, you know? And we know we've been giving some responses on the way. Uh, it's interesting when he says in Exodus 25 that I'm a jealous God visiting the iniquity, Pakad, uh, of Kad, uh, and the fathers upon the children until the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Notice this is a conditional clause of those who what? Of those who hate hate me. You know, yeah. it's very clear. It's of those who hate him. If an individual in a family chooses to love God <laughs> and repent and get right with the Lord, that doesn't apply to him. Yeah. Okay, because in the very next verse, verse six says this in Hebrews chapter twenty or Exodus chapter twenty. He promises to show, quote, love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. <laughs> so guess what? If you turn, turn you'll <laughs> yeah. receive his blessing. It's the end of the children of Israel. Romans 8, 28. You know, if you choose to love him, for we, we know that God, you know, God works all things together for the good for those who love God. They're called according to his purpose. There is a choice. Deuteronomy 30, 19 says, This day I shall call heaven and earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses now choose life so that you and your children may live he said it doesn't say renounce all the sins of your parents and name them by name and and, and then go to a deliverance ministry and get a barf bag and throw up demons and so forth no choose to choose life choose the word of the lord you know and of course yeah there are these curses that are passed down for those who hate him okay the scriptures do talk about that but there's this very interesting passage. And Chad, you and I talk about this passage once in a while. Talk about it a little bit in Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel 18, uh, it is the first thing I ever taught from uh, from Scripture uh, in front of any Praise setting. God. And it's one of my favorite passages, and specifically because what it's dealing with. And the first thing that he starts it out with is that Israel has this proverb, this saying that they're saying, and he said, you are not going to say this saying anymore. And it's, the fathers eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. And he says, you will not say this anymore in all of Israel because... That the father's th punishing the children because of yep, the, the father's Exactly. Sins. And yeah. he said, because what's the... If you ask me, what does Ezekiel 18 teach? If you could summarize it, God summarized it over and over again. The soul that sins will die. The, the, that we all have responsibility for Each and every one of us. Amen. Praise God. I'm glad you said that. Let me read Ezekiel 18, 1 through 4. The word of the Lord came to me saying, What do you mean when you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set at the edge? As I live, says the Lord God, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. So it's, you know, basically, you said it, you got it right, Chad. He's basically saying each soul, sons, fathers they're responsible to me and i'm not punishing the children because of what the parents did you know it's not like wow you know what that that guy right there he is a hit and run i'm gonna go arrest his five-year-old kid and put his five-year-old kid in prison you know that's not how god works you know god is perfectly just perfectly fair and i love what i love about ezekiel 18 is that he gives you every picture that you can have in terms of that scenario because he gives you the watchman and the yeah and he gives you the father and him walking in iniquity and you as a son seeing that and saying, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to turn from yeah, that amen. and then you will live. Then he gives the scenario of you walking, of that son then walking in, walking in truth and then someone saying, oh, I'm going to go walk in darkness. And he says, nope, now you're going to die. That's right. And then also he, he gives the it. beautiful promises in that text, specifically that those who would turn from their wicked ways, they would see these things, turn from it, that he remembers their sin no longer. Oh, it's, it's so just, beautiful. I love that. I yeah, love and then down chapter. near the end, verse 20, he says, the son will not share the guilt of Amen. the father. That spells it out. The son will not share the guilt of the father. Amen. Nor will the father share the guilt of the son. So it's really clear that God doesn't hold your children guilty because of things that you've done. 
In Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 16, it says, Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their fathers. A person shall be put to death for his own sin. So that's in the law, even before you get to the prophets. That's why the Lord is saying, don't be using this proverb. This isn't what I teach, that the children are being punished. And they have crooked teeth because of the sins of the parents <laughs> and what have you, that that's what I'm doing. So there, and there's, there's a bigger picture because it's not just the curse to Israel. There's a curse that all humans are under, and that's the curse of death. So when the first human sinned, you know, we have the law of God, it says, written on our hearts. Amen. And when the first human sinned, guess what? They were booted out of Eden. They were made from the dust. Adam was made from the dust. You're going to return to the dust. There was death. And there's thorns and thistles came up. Curse is the ground because of you. So let no one say to you that, you know, we're not cursed. Yeah, humanity is under a curse, the curse of God's law. Okay, whether it's the general law, a moral law of God, which is written in our hearts, all of humanity, or whether it's a more specific uh, mosaic code that was given at Sinai, which has the moral law, but also has the civil laws and has the typological laws and so forth in Israel. So that's what the Jews are under. But we still, humans, die. We die because we are under a curse. And guess what? There is a sense in which there is humanity suffers generational curses. We read it right here, Romans 3.23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it's sin, we're told, in the scripture that we had, that was passed down or inherited through Adam. Okay, So from one generation, Adam's children and their children on, there's these sin that's passed down and the curse because of sin. But there has to be a distinction that's made. It's not that cut and dry. Okay, It's very important that we understand that the Bible says very clearly that, you know, Paul talks about a choice being made. Even though he emphasizes in chapter 5 that we have inherited a sinful nature from Adam, he also lets us know that it's our choice as to whether or not we sin or not. That's in Romans 7. You guys are very familiar with that. Yeah. When Paul says, I was alive apart from the law. Meaning there was a time where Paul was before the age of accountability and he was spiritually alive. If he would have died as a two-year-old, one-year-old, Jesus said, let the little children come to me for of such is the kingdom of heaven. You know, you want to get, you want to come to go to heaven? Jesus says, you got to be like one of these little children. Humble yourself. You know, these little children have, they're not, they don't have the knowledge of the law. They don't realize they're breaking God's law. So when there's no law, there's no sin, it says. When they become aware of the law, Paul said, then I became aware of the law. And, it, you know, thou shalt not covet. <laughs> yeah, produce all a matter of coveting me. And I died. So then Paul needed to be born again. And then he said, who will save me from this body of death? The law led him to Jesus as a school teacher, another F, uh Awesome emphasis, awesome teaching. So guess what? Paul wasn't hellbound because of Adam's sin or his father's sin. That's a good point. Paul yeah. wasn't doomed until he purposely chose to break God's moral law and sin. So guess what? The generational curses don't even damn you until you choose to become a rebel against mm, the Lord. I love that's this a good word, yeah. And everything just fits together. It's so beautiful. But Paul declares, just as a result wow. of one trespass was condemnation for all men, for all men, not all babies, for all men. So also the result of one act of righteousness, what Jesus did on the cross, was justification that brings life for all men. And just as what Adam did, right, provides the path of death and condemnation for everyone, what Jesus did on the cross provides the means of salvation for everyone because he provided an atonement for everyone. And Jesus said to the Jews that believed in him, he said, if you hold to my teaching, if you abide in my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free, right? Chapter, same chapter, thirty, uh, chapter 8, verse 35. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. Verse 36. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. indeed. First John 3, 8, man. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. I love Hebrews 2. It talks about how Jesus took a body that was prepared for him for the purpose of destroying the works of the devil and delivering us from the fear of death. I love Acts chapter 10, verse 38. It talks about how Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. He sets us free from the bondage of the enemy through the atonement, through what he did for us. We, If you're a Christian and somebody's telling you, well, you have these generational curses that you're under, man, you're doomed. You, you got to go to this deliverance church. You've got to cough up demons, you know. You've got to try to figure out what the sins of your parents were. Was any of your great, any of your ancestors into witchcraft or something? And then you could renounce all these things by name and, and barf in this bag and you'll be set free. That is so ridiculous and it's so heartbreaking because 
turns people away from the finished work of Christ and what he did on the cross to save us. And they'll Listen. also say, by the way, that if you're not doing those things in terms of as a deliverance ministry, that you're actually not even preaching the gospel, by the way. They add that as well. I just oh, yeah. listened to one of those false teachers teaching that. Yeah, it becomes a wife. false gospel. Yeah. It's almost Amen. like those guys that say you have to Bethel. do the dominion mandate, yep, too. You got it. And, and otherwise, that's not the whole gospel. That's a different gospel. You're adding on to the gospel a, a seven mountain mandate or some dominion mandate from Genesis 1 that applies to animals and not taking over governments, telling people they're not preaching the gospel unless you're doing that. Same thing. So you've got these strange gospels. But guess what? If you are trusting Jesus' brothers and sisters, praise the Lord, man. First of all, I can call you brothers and sisters. You're all <laughs> of our brothers and sisters. We're one big family. We love the Lord. Yeah. He's redeemed us by his precious blood. You are not under the curse. You know, you're not under the curse of the law anymore. Listen to what it says. Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 12. For as many as are of the works of the law, that's those who are trying to keep the law of Moses, are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. But then in verse 13 we read, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. You know what? Don't look to a bag to spit a demon in. You know, don't look to renounce what your ancestors did and fear demons could possess you or that you're possessed because of things they had done. Recognize this. Guess what, man? My parents didn't know Jesus. As far as I know, my grandparents didn't know Jesus and their grandpa their parents didn't know Jesus. And guess what? I was under demonic powers, man. I had given myself over to them by choice. But when I cried out to the Lord Jesus Christ, man, when I cried out to him, laying in bed there, recognizing there was demonic forces and they were real, boom, God delivered me. I didn't have to barf in any bag. I didn't have to think, look up my parents and their, or great-grandparents. And I began to share Jesus with everybody and see them set free. I didn't, Amen. They, none of them had to barf in bags. This is a lie. What happens, which is really weird, the people that get caught up in these things start to get demonized very often yes. because they start becoming infatuated with these demonic principalities. They open themselves up to these powers often. Second Corinthians 5.21 he made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's who you are, brother and sister. If you're trusting Jesus, you are not under the curse of the law. You are, you are the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. But every person, whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is liberty. That's just a beautiful promise. I love 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. The old... All things are have become new. That's beautiful. In fact, you know what? The Bible teaches that you cannot. The Bible says, "What fellowship does light have with darkness? Amen. What fellowship, you know, does, does does God have with demons? He doesn't. Can't and sit we're at the, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Lord, yeah. Amen. You partake of them. He's not going to partake of you. But He says, "Come out from among them. Be separate, saith the Lord. Then you'll be my sons and your daughters. So you got to choose one side or the other. And I just Romans eight one. I love it. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in, in Christ, Christ Jesus. Jesus. John 5, 24, those who believe, present tense, continue to trust him, have passed from death to life, and shall not come into condemnation. So how does this apply if you've been caught up in the deliverance ministries and, and being led astray by them? Well, you need to repent of being involved in deliverance ministries. Amen. You fall before God and say, God, I've been entertaining false doctrine, but thank you for revealing yourself to me through Scripture that it's all about Jesus and knowing him and walking with him and living with him. You don't have to go to church and you have to just repent. If you're not believing, you're listening. Yeah, guess what? You're under the curse of law. Metanoia, though. Amen. Repentance, man. You just need to repent, turn from darkness, and embrace Jesus Christ through faith and uh, and, and the light of Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. And if you are a Christian, and you're walking with Jesus. Recognize that. Yeah, there can be strongholds in your life as a Christian. These are consequences to maybe your parents were bad examples to you. Uh, maybe you had a mom that was a meth addict, a dad was a drunk, and they neglected you and abused you, and you're suffering some consequences. Those aren't curses if you're believing you're following Jesus. Those are consequences, okay? And guess what? You need to simply say, okay, guess what? I'm suffering some because of neglect or abuse or some things in my life as a result of that. Guess what the scriptures say to do? The scriptures say to seek the Lord. The scriptures say in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, to offer up your bodies as you know, holy and acceptable sacrifices, which is your reasonable service. He says, and don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So, brothers and sisters, how do you, you got to just grow in Christ now. You're a Christian, you're a new creation. You have you don't have demons, okay? Guess what? You have the flesh. You need to crucify the flesh. You know, walk in the newness of life. Rejoice that you're a new creation, that old things have passed away, and continue to be renewed 
in your mind and not conform to the pattern of the world, but renewed in your mind as you meditate on Scripture day and night and you continue to worship the Lord, you pray to Him, you seek Him and give Him glory and sing to Him. And guess what? It's a lot simpler than people want to make it and you'll be changed from glory to glory. And guess what? Even those consequences one day become the past and we'll have a new, we'll be in a new heaven, a new earth, or with the Lord, we'll have new bodies. There will be no vestige of even the physical curse that we bear because we're in these dead bodies. Amen. So I want to just thank Pastor Joe Schimmel and Brother Chad Davidson for that awesome, awesome teaching and breakdown of generational curses, bloodlines, covenant, and all that jargon. Thank you so much. You know, I realize that if you listen to these people like the Najas of the world, the Tiffany Montgomery's of the world, the that guy that Tiffany and 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 Naja was talking about, Solomon, and you know you listen to the Alexander Pagani's of the world, um, and there's many more names, many more Benny Hinn's of the world. They will have you walking around living a miserable life. Shoot, you might not even be walking around. You, you just probably be locked up in your house every day, all day. Because according to them and their teachings and their beliefs, if you drink the Kool-Aid that they're selling, you would assume that everything has a demon. Under every rock is a demon. Right? And um, that's not a good and healthy way to live. In this world in this life as a Christian as a believer when we are told by the Lord that um, he does not give us a spirit of fear oh there is a spirit of fear yes notice how they don't talk about that though you know they don't talk about that and there is a spirit of heaviness which really translate to depression and these People will have you emotionally messed up. Yeah. And so, you know, here's what they don't remind you to do. Let me tell you what they don't remind you. They don't remind you what... Let me, let me turn to it. Hold on. Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 says, Finally, brethren... Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. As I've said before, listening to those people and people like them, you know, I remember, um, you know, I, I was young in the faith. And just growing and learning and just, you know, I used to listen to these and, and, and follow these different programs on TV. Um, Sid Roth is one of those guys I used to listen to, right? And he'd bring on these strange characters. And they, and, and, and even they, you know, it's, it's always near-death experience. And they was in heaven and they held hand with Jesus. And they, you know, walked through the garden and, you know, was picking daffodils and, smelling the lavenders with Jesus up there in heaven and I'm like after a while I just says no no this 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 ain't it this can't be it there's no way this is not adding up this is not what I see in scripture right so I I I started to move away from those people you know start to move away from the people who are really big on money and a lot of numbers and you know, so this X amount of seed and that that seed and it, it, it was just too much. And then if you're not careful, you keep on tuning into them. You keep on searching them out to hear what they say. Thus say the Lord, because, you know, they make it seem as if only God is, you know, speaking to them, which, by the way, that's weird. Why is God always waking them up in the middle of the night? Like, come on now. Now, I do recall there is a situation in, in scripture where a man was sleeping. I mean, this man was fast asleep, enjoying his rest. And God disturbed that man in his sleep and told him, give back Abraham, his wife. That man name is 
um, Abimelech. He was a king. Um, I believe he was a king of Gerar, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And you can find that in Genesis chapter 20, verses 2 through 18. I'm not going to exhaust you with all of that, but you can go and check it out. Genesis chapter 2. I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 20, verse 2 through 18. And, um, yeah, he was disturbed out of his sleep. But, you know, he was no man of God. He was no prophet. There's a huge difference today between these so-called prophets and prophetess of God versus those whom we clearly can see and find in Scripture who these two groups shared. They don't share anything in common. Prophets in ancient days and times, they had a message from God to the kings in the land, the governments, government officials in the land, to the nation. Okay? Versus today, these men and women, all they're all over the place with their motivational so-called prophecies and affirmations. They're all over the place. And that brings confusion. And we know that God is not the author of confusion. So, if you follow these, these people today, as I said earlier, you'd be looking for demons even underneath your bed, in the trunk of your vehicle, you know, at, at the workplace. And these people will have you to not live a comfortable life with people, even with unbelievers. They will have you to be constantly in fear and full of anxiety and worries about your co-worker and your unsaved loved ones. Don't listen to them. Numerology, Synchronicity, Bibliomancy, and Angel Numbers. I've done a video on this before titled Bibliomancy. I thought that was a very, very well put together, thorough, well-researched video. And I thought I did a good job on it. Well, she's still playing these card games. She's still playing um, this, 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 this game of no, it's not. It's not divination. It's not angel numbers. You know, this is the Lord showing me the meanings of, of numbers. And there's a book in the Bible titled Numbers. And these are her claims. This is what she wants you to believe, that she's not seeking for an omen or, or that she's not a seer. She's practicing. This, this is definitely not of the Holy Spirit. So in this segment of this video, we're going to unpack this again, but this time, this time, she cannot refute this one. Let's go. And a lot of people are seeing repetitive numbers. So when I went into new age, I started seeing repetitive numbers over and over and over and over again. Now, let me tell you something. I, I must say this. God created numbers. Real quick, I just want to say something because this this been on my mind and my heart from the first time I've seen this video. Do you notice the book that's behind her over her left shoulder? Yeah, that book. That's her testimony book. And on the front cover, you, you, you can see her, right, holding the horse, posing with the horse. And if you see her right here, right now, sitting down, she looks very similar to her picture on the book. Why am I bringing this up? Because when she gave her testimony, which I had seen her testimony years ago, I remember she was sharing that that was one of her favorite pictures and that she was dressed up, if, if I remember correctly, if I remember correctly. Don't hold me to it. It's been years now. But I do remember she talked about she was dressed up and she was in that witch frame of mind. You know, she was practicing divination back then. So that image that you see on the book, that's one of her one of her favorite pictures. And it's why she have it on the book cover. And as I'm looking at her, I'm like, you look you look the same. It, you know, just it, it just could be a co it could be a coincidental thing. You know, may, may, maybe that's what it is. Okay. God does speak through numbers. 
There's a whole book in the Bible called Numbers. So he does interpret them, but the importance of you getting the understanding of what those numbers mean needs to come through scripture. It needs to come through um, the Greek concordance, not Google. When you Google numbers, you will get angel numbers. That's the first thing that pops up. And because it uses the word angel in it is the reason why we think that it's okay and that it's God. But angel numbers, the interpretation is done through tarot cards. Okay, so while you think that the angels are talking to you, you're getting guidance from a familiar spirit, from demons. Okay, so I see numbers every day. Whenever the Lord wants to remind me to study, because I may not have studied that day, he shows me 333. And that's in reference to Jeremiah 33, 3, where he says, call to me and I will show you great and mighty things you do not know. So that's his way of saying, you better come sit down. You better come sit down and talk to me. I got things I need to know. All right. So please, if you're seeing repetitive numbers, another good reference is um, Troy Brewer. That's B-R-E-W-E-R. -E and so when I heard her mention this man's name, I was blown away because I'm like, I dealt with this man also in the Bibliomancy video. And so we're going to look at him again. Do you see now? how these birds of the same feather flock together all the usual suspects she's calling their names and she's directing people who listen to her believe in her follows her to also support those charlatans ministries yeah yeah and he is on YouTube. He also wrote the book Numbers That Preach. And he gives amazing, accurate interpretation based on scripture in regards to numbers so that you're not Googling them and getting angel numbers. Okay. Hold up. Now, three videos prior to this one, she made this one. Yesterday, I look at the time on my uh, microwave and I see the word or the number 1134 the time was 1134 normally any other time I would have saw the time 1134 and thought nothing of it but you know how back when in the day when we used to have pagers and we would put numbers in the pagers and you could turn it upside down and read a word instead of seeing 1134 I literally saw the word hell he allowed me to see the word hell and so I said Lord what is this about why am I seeing this and then I see the numbers 1111 11 repeatedly. Now, don't come for me. I'm not talking about angel numbers. Came out of new age, okay? The Lord created numbers and he speaks through numbers. And you must utilize the interpretation through scripture or the Greek concordance, okay? There's a whole book in the Bible called Numbers. Wow. Just wow. Right? So the number 111 means lawlessness. It means lawlessness. And so he was revealing to me, the people are practicing lawlessness and they are going to hell. And I'm calling people and they are sitting still. This is not the time for you to sit still and doubt your abilities. This is not the time for you to be thinking about yourself, being concerned about how other people are going to look at you or whether or not you're going to be efficient in what you're doing. If God called you, he obviously thought you was going to be efficient. It's time to get busy. Obedient. Okay. It's time to be obedient to the Lord. Here's the thing, Naja. Here's the thing. I didn't need you to give me any numbers, whether they are repetitive, whether they match colors, whether they rhyme, I don't need numbers to remind me to be obedient to the spirit of the living God. Troy Brewer, the numbers man. Hey guys, Matt here. Welcome to Learn to Discern. 
Today we're going to be assessing some teaching from Troy Brewer. We're going to look at a couple of clips taken from an interview posted to YouTube. After each of those clips, we'll come back, we'll open up our Bibles, and we will compare what he is saying to the Word of God. But first, if you'd like to help promote Christian content here on YouTube, please go ahead and take a second now to subscribe to my channel, and thank you in advance. All right, before we get going, I just want to point out that Troy Brewer is probably most well known for his teachings on numbers. So he likes to talk a lot about the symbolism of numbers, numbers in the Bible, and uh, talk to you about God speaking to you through number signs. So we are particularly going to be assessing those sorts of teachings. And if you've already made up your mind on how you feel about God speaking to people through number signs, I still encourage you to watch the entirety of this video because I think you're going to gain some valuable information. All right, we're ready to go. So let's jump into our first clip. So I just couldn't help it. I had to do it because the revelation that is in that is something that all of us need to know because God, it is definitely one of the voices of the Lord. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The voice of the Lord is upon the many waters. Where do you find that at? You find that in Psalms 29. What is 29? <laughs> well, it represents mountain climbing. Like what? Like what are you talking about? Well, there are actually 29 Bibles listed. I'm sorry, 29 mountains listed in the Bible. 29 of them. And then, of course, you know, we do a work in Nepal. We say boys and girls are sexual trafficking there. And I was in Kathmandu a few years ago. I took a helicopter up to base camp of Mount Everest, a mountain that has a very prophetic name, Everest, tallest mountain in the world. Mm. And while I was there, I learned that if you look up the official height of Mount Everest, it's 29,000, 29 feet tall. And wow. I could also tell you it was overcome by 29-year-old Sir Edmund Hillary on May the 29th of 1953. Come on. And like, why, why would it be like that? Because the author is the same. The author of the Bible and the author of creation is the same exact person. So once you see it in the Bible, you start to see it everywhere around you. And, it's like, and it becomes like a prophetic marker that glorifies God. Okay, guys, a lot of information was shared there, but remember, when we do Christian discernment, we need to slow down and take the time to assess the things that were being taught to us. So the title of this original message on YouTube is, Is God Talking to You Through Numbers? And Troy Brewer is going to argue that, yes, God is speaking to you through numbers. So when he goes to back up his claim that God is speaking to you through numbers, he starts by quoting a verse out of Psalm 29, talking about the voice of the Lord is upon the waters. So we're going to look at Psalm 29. We're going to go from verse 3 to verse 8. And just pay attention and see if this passage is teaching that God speaks to you through numbers. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders, the Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Sarian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. Friends, Psalm 29, in particular that passage that we were looking at, is really talking about God's strength being demonstrated in a storm. So that's why the voice of the Lord really here is talking about thunder, that you can see God's power in a storm. So if you're trying to use this and connect it to the fact that God speaks with numerous different voices. Uh, this isn't even saying it's an actual voice, uh, like it's conveying a message other than the general concept that God is very powerful. So you can't use this verse to, or this passage to support the idea that God speaks to you through numbers. So that doesn't mean that it couldn't be found somewhere else in scripture, but it certainly is not taught in Psalm 29. So I, I don't really get how he makes that connection. So to try to back up his claim, though, where God is going to speak to you through numbers, he says that 29 is the number for mountains. So he says this is really significant. You know, where do you find the, vo uh, the uh, verse, the voice of the Lord is over the waters? He's like, well, it's in Psalm 29, and 29 is the number for mountains. And if you just sit and think about it, friends, like, what is the connection there? I'm not trying to make fun of the guy, but seriously, he, he made it seem like it was important that 29 somehow symbolizes mountains and the voice of the Lord is over the waters? That that doesn't connect in any sort of way, so I, I don't really understand. Uh, but I think sometimes 
people just start talking so quickly and they're sharing so much information that it's like, wow, this is really profound. But when you sit and think about it, that, that doesn't even make sense. But now I want to assess the actual claims that he was making because he was saying, you know, 29 is the number of mountains. And then he gives all this information to show, wow, God is speaking through numbers. So let's assess some of the claims that he made. So he said, first off, that there are 29 mountains in scripture. Friends, I encourage you, by the way, to, to fact check me on all of this stuff. You can go to Google and type in how many mountains are there in the Bible? And you can find that there are over 40. There are not 29 mountains in scripture. And so this he's off on that number right off the bat. From there, he said that the official height of Mount Everest is 29,029 feet. Again, go on Google and type it in. It is 29,032 feet. So he is now wrong with a second piece of information. And I am not going to try to figure out if this is intentional deceit or lying or whether or not he is just misinformed. I don't know. I don't know what's going on in Troy's head, but the, the fact of the matter is he's made two claims so far and they are both verifiably false by just finding the information. And so that should be cause for concern if somebody is building a major doctrine upon this and teaching it as though it's very important, yet when you take the time to look into it, it's not lining up. So let's keep going. He said that Mount Everest was first climbed by 29-year-old Edmund Hillary on May 29th, 1953. So the, the last part is correct. It was May 29th, 1953. That is true. But Edmund Hillary was born in 1919. So all you have to do is some simple math and you will figure out that he was 32 when he climbed Mount Everest. So again, he's just like, the height of Mount Everest is this, there's 29, 29, and there's 29 mountains in the Bible. And it was a 29 year old who climbed it on May 29th. And it's uh, friends, all except for one was incorrect. And so he's making it seem really significant but this information is simply not true. So not only does that maybe tell us something about the quality of the teaching, that calls into question um, Troy Brewer's, I don't want to say integrity, I mean it, it could, but it certainly calls into question whether or not we can trust him when he is teaching if he's providing information that is verifiably false. Now I also want to point out before we get to our next clips, friends, you're going to have a really difficult time pointing out to me how this is not numerology. And I'm going to look further into that question after our second clip. But somebody who is into the new age and numerology, when they hear this, they're not going to make a distinction. They're going to hear, oh, this is numerology. This is what is taking place here. So I would truly want someone to explain to me how it's not numerology because I've actually heard many people, including Troy Brewer, teach and they say, now this isn't numerology. No, don't come for me. I'm not talking about angel numbers came out of new age okay the lord created numbers and he speaks through numbers and you must utilize the interpretation through scripture or the greek concordance okay there's a whole book in the bible called numbers but then they teach and i'm like boy this sounds exactly like numerology so so you'd have to explain to me how it isn't and also i would point out how is this supposed to help anybody in the faith i mean if 29 were the mount, uh, number for mountains which it's not but if it were and if everest was 29,029 and Edmund Hillary was 29 when he climbed it. What am I supposed to do with that information? Is that supposed to help me? I don't see that any of this is pertinent or relevant to my faith. And I don't have a difficult time believing that God is sovereign, that God is powerful, that God is in control. But I can go to a passage like Psalm 29 and read it in context and I can come to that conclusion. Thanks, Matt. You did a fantastic job on this breakdown of Mr. Brewer. Thank you so much. God bless you, brother. Keep up the good work, continue to live on purpose, godly purpose. And while we're here on this topic of your numerology again, <laughs> let's go on over and let me introduce to you a man who is not even a Christian. And let's see if he can do the same things you're doing with these prophetic numbers. An analysis on repetitive numbers from an atheist. In this channel, then you know my number one reason for deconverting and for not believing that the God of the Bible is true is the Bible itself. However, maybe that's going to change because the video I'm about to show you claims that it proves the Bible is 100% 
true. And I'm sure that whatever this video is, it is well researched, logical, filled with common sense without reaching, stretching, cherry picking, or straight up lying. Let's watch. This is the proof that you needed to see that the Bible is from God. Psalm 118 is the middle chapter of the entire Bible. Psalm 117 before Psalm 118 is the shortest chapter in the Bible. Psalm 119 after Psalm 118 is the longest chapter in the Bible. The Bible has 594 chapters before Psalm 118 and 594 chapters after Psalm 118. If you add up all the chapters except Psalm 118, you get a total of 1,188 chapters. 1,188 or Psalm 118 verse 8 is the middle verse of the entire Bible. And should that central verse not have an important message, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Life, sir. <sighs> okay, before I reveal to you just how ridiculous this video is, let me tell you what today's episode is all about. Today we're looking at how shamelessly people try to make claims for the Bible, God, divinity, truth, etc. using really poor and weak methods. Between this video and the video I'm going to show you in the later part of this episode, we could just wrap this up as the problems with biblical numerology. And yes, that's a thing, and you would be amazed at how far it reaches. Just look at the comments on the video I just shared. People are absolutely amazed by this. This counts as proof to them. They are sharing this without regard, their faith is being heightened, etc. So you may be a Christian watching this saying, well, that's silly, that's not the reason I believe. I don't think you understand just how many of the claims that you have accepted as part of your personal truth come from equally weak methods of argumentation. Today we're focusing on this, but in doing so, we're going to get to cover a few of the logical fallacies that believers like to commit. So. Where does this first video go wrong? Well, it's true that the Protestant Bible has 1,189 chapters, no matter how you split it. It's a good thing they used that canon and not, say, the Ethiopian Orthodox canon at 1,394 chapters or the Eastern Orthodox canon at 1,383 chapters. Cherry picking the canon you want to use this off of is a good step for using numerology to prove that the Bible is true. But Brandon, those are very uncommon canons. I don't know that that would matter, but if you want to make another logical fallacy on top of this one, let's go ahead and use the appeal to majority, and instead of using the Protestant canon, let's use the Catholic canon. But if you do this, you'll end up with 1,551 chapters, and we won't get that pretty middle chapter and all the math just fails. But that's okay. For sake of the argument, let's assume that the Protestant canon is the only true canon, and thus it was the only one that could show us the truth by using this little math trick. The problem with that is that this canon didn't have chapters and verses until the 13th century. So I want to back it up and just talk about this claim a little bit more holistically. Even if all of this was true, if all of these different iterations and variations did not exist and it has always been and for all people is that the middle scripture of their holy book says this, would it matter? Would it mean anything? This belief of some hidden meaning needs to be examined in and of itself. We should be examining these claims based off of logical criticisms. This would include things like history and context, the concepts of subjectivity and cherry picking, contextual interpretation, mathematical coincidence, and skeptical analysis. There's a pretty number for you. Seven. Doesn't mean anything. On top of that, we could have even done this another way. They got the middle verse by coming in from both ends, but the way they presented it is that Psalm 118 is the middle chapter. If Psalm 18 is the middle chapter, one could just look at the middle verse of Psalm 118, which is not 8, it's 15. And it reads, Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I guarantee you if they had done this other way of getting to the central verse in the Bible, they would have used something like, oh, the tents of the righteous. The Bible is like a tent. It's a covering and you uncover it and it's righteousness. And the Lord's right hand, what do people predominantly write with? Oh, their right hand. The Bible was something written. Written by whom? God. God's right hand. Look, it's all right here. You can do it with anything. Look, I'll make up my own right now. Let's pick a number. What's a biblical number? Let's do a bad biblical number. Let's do 666, the mark of the beast, or the devil, or antichrist, or however you want to interpret this. Let's just go to the 666th verse of the Bible, which happens to be Genesis 31 verse 1. Jacob heard that Laban's sons were saying, Jacob has taken everything our father owned and has gained all the wealth from what belonged to our father. Oh my gosh. Verse 666 is about Jacob. What does Jacob's name get changed to? Israel. The Antichrist 
is Israel. It's not a person, it's a whole group. Or maybe the Antichrist is coming from Israel. We've cracked the code. It makes sense it would come from God's own chosen people. And how much further down the verses do we find out that Jacob becomes Israel? 27 verses later. That's how many chapters are in the New Testament. Look, it's all making sense. No, it's not. None of that makes sense. But I guarantee you, if I put it to some pretty music and did a little bit more explaining with some really nice visuals, I could get this thing shipped around the internet. You can do this with anything. So, speaking of just completely manipulating numbers, let's look at a second video. Now this video doesn't make some of the big bombastic claims, but this individual has a channel where he does a lot of this kind of thing, and in this particular video he's going to show us the significance of the number 12 in the Bible. Let's watch. Jesus had 12 disciples. Jesus was 12 years old when he was found in the temple. 12 basketfuls remained when Jesus fed the 5,000. Jesus healed a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. Jesus brought back to life the daughter of Jairus when she was 12. Jesus said the 12 apostles would sit on 12 thrones and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. When arrested, Jesus said he can call on 12 legions of angels. 12 spies scouted the promised land. Jacob had 12 sons. Hmm. Cool trick. Let me see if I can do it. Let's choose the number 10. There were 10 commandments given to Moses on Mount Sinai. There were 10 plagues brought upon the Pharaoh and the Egyptians. There were 10 spies sent by Moses to explore the land of Canaan. God just needed 10 righteous people to spare the city of Sodom. Jesus healed 10 lepers. In the parable of the wise and foolish virgins, there are 10 virgins. In the parable of the talents, there are 10 talents. In the book of Revelation, we learn about the 10 horns representing the 10 kings. In the letter to the church in Smyrna, we learn about the 10 days of tribulation. And in Ezekiel, we hear about the 10 elders sitting before God's throne in the heavenly vision. So what? The Bible is a form of ancient literature. Guess what both ancient and modern literature do? Symbolism. Symbolism is not the same thing as secret messages and signs. Now, I will give you that the vast amount of symbolism used in the Bible makes the ability to take the Bible literally way, way less. Everything always took 40 years or 40 days? Probably not. So literalism goes out the window a little bit. Let's first look at some common symbolism with numbers in the Bible. The number one symbolizes unity, oneness, and uniqueness. It represents the concept of God. The number three symbolizes completeness, and divine perfection, as associated with the Trinity. Four represents the created world, the four corners of the earth, the four elements. Seven is considered a number of perfection or divine completeness. Ten symbolizes completeness as well, divine order and the fullness of a divine cycle. It's associated with the Ten Commandments, representing the moral law. Twelve signifies government or organizational perfection by divine authority. It is associated with the twelve tribes of Israel in the Old Testament and the twelve apostles in the New Testament. We can jump up to a number like 40, which represents a period of testing, trial, or probation, such as the 40 days and nights of rain during the great flood, flood, the 40 years of Israel's wandering in the wilderness, the 40 days of fasting, etc. Now, not everything has to mean anything. You're going to be able to do this little trick with any large book. Again, using the Protestant canon and the most popular modern translation, which would be the NIV, we see that the Bible has over 726,000 words words. That's a big book. It's going to mention some numbers. It's going to mention some of those numbers a lot more than once. In fact, I took it upon myself to go ahead and get you the specifics. So the individual in this video claiming that it's amazing that these things are always in Acts of 12 shared, what, 15 or 20 examples from 187 different times that that number is listed, which is not even one of the top numbers listed in the Bible. It just equates to a nothing burger. That video means nothing. But look at the comments on it. Even though this man didn't claim a ton associated with it, the comments are just people's minds are blown. What a special number. And then people are looking for these numbers to fulfill prophecy or make decisions off of, etc. There are hundreds, if not thousands of videos on YouTube that I could point you to where people are bending these numbers and have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. The fact that so many believers have latched on to this so wholeheartedly shows me a gap, a need that they have to find ways to prove this to themselves. Though this video was done on two pretty silly videos that I wouldn't take seriously and many Christians watching won't take seriously, the facts here remain the same. We need to be way more scrupulous with how we determine truth, how we define proof because the middle chapter of the Bible is pretty easy to make fun of and debunk, but all the other ways that the believer convinces themselves of this truth through things that can be just as messy and misused, such as anecdotal experience, finding meaning in patterns in your life, seeing prophecy that is fulfilled, we simply just don't 
tend to be as critical as we need to when it's something that we already want to believe. And for those of us that are born into this, that are indoctrinated into it, or even worse, that are emotionally convinced of something and convert because of that emotion, it's very easy to look at the Bible as something after the fact and say, hey, I'm a believer now. I have a relationship with Jesus. That's how I know Jesus is real. Let me apply all of those feelings and all of those personal convictions when I read the Bible. That's backwards. We first need to be able to prove the Bible in and of itself and then take whatever is fundamentally true, logically sound, and consistent with the things we do know to be true in history, in science, in authorship, etc., and see what we have left, and then do the claims that remain equal the truth that you're believing and claiming for yourself. I went through those rigors. I went through that testing. I went through that approach of first making sure that the source material was accurate and trustworthy before basing any more beliefs off of it. And it completely broke apart my entire world. It wasn't something I wanted to do. I didn't have any anger or hurt against God as so many of you in the comments have claimed. I simply demanded a higher level of certainty before I continued to pass this on to my children. And when doing that, it all fell apart. That's not on me. So a bit of a silly video to cover a bit of a pretty serious topic. I hope you learned something today. I hope that this was enjoyable. I hope that this was interesting. This young man's name is Brandon and this is his YouTube channel. I browsed his channel. I looked at all 200 plus of his videos, read the titles and everything, read his bio. This is a young man who has he said he debunked his 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 faith in Christianity and he's no longer a follower of Jesus Christ no believer in, the, in our Lord Jesus Christ I'll tell you something I watched this video twice of him just debunking the whole numerology th thing he is good. This man is good. I pulled from an atheist critical thinking to show you how even an atheist could look at things what nausea presents as, oh, I see. 444 and 777 and 1111 and 1010. And he just dismantled this teaching. Dismantle it. Brandon, we need you back on the Lord's side. We need you, brother. Well, I can't call you brother anymore. Yeah, I can't call you a brother. And you can't call me your brother. In the faith, that is. But I like you, Brandon. I like you. I like I like how you think. You are a thinker. You unpack everything and you examine everything. But come on back on our side, man. Come on back on our side. Now I've never done anything like this before. I've looked at a professing atheist debunking um one of these fallacies that these charlatans that these christians are using numerology and here is an atheist saying yeah it's it's hogwash I was a psychic medium for many years and dabbling in other tools of divination including numerology if you want to know why i was a psychic medium and am not anymore feel free to check out my testimony on youtube i'm going to put the little video here now back to numbers so i went to numerologist i had charts done my sister had numerology books we were reading each other like i mean it was oh it was awful you may be acquainted with the 1111s the 444s repetitive numbers 777 but what about when mom or dad passes away and then you're driving and the license plate in front of you has mom or dad's birthday some of this is rooted in superstition where people would see these numbers and think it would bring them luck and we know superstition has an occult um, connotation to it relying on fate or magic 
Having said that, a lot of people are acquainted with something they think is called angel numbers. So the 1111 would be what the New Age would say, an angel communicating with you. The thing is, my friends, all of those people that wrote the New Age books, the angel communication, the angel numbers, the angel cards, they were using automatic writing to write the meanings that you think now are these secret messages. Automatic writing is when you are invoking demons. Numerology is just another form of divination, which is going outside of God's will and boundaries to access supernatural knowledge. And it is a lie from the evil one. It's idolatrous, in fact, as well, because you're going away from God, you're not going to God, and you're going to a number. Then, having said that, sometimes, you know, the New Age has really been creeping into the church, so people talk about biblical numerology. So let's talk about that for a second, too. Biblical numerology is the study of numbers, not going to numbers for hidden secret information. As a matter of fact, I want to share with you a little information from gotquestions.org. According to gotquestions.org, whether or not the numbers really do have a significance is debated in many circles. The Bible definitely seems to use numbers in patterns or to teach spiritual truth. However, many people put too much significance on biblical numerology, trying to find a special meaning behind every number in the Bible. Often, a number in the Bible is simply a number. God does not call us to search for secret meanings, hidden messages, and codes in the Bible. There is more than enough truth in the words and meanings of Scripture to meet all our needs and make us complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16-17. The devil is an absolute copycat. He's taken what God has created and trying to put a big old spin and twist on it. When I was a medium, I would, I knew um, from my numerology days, you know, what these, what certain numbers would represent. And so when I was doing readings, I was a psychic medium. So I mainly just fed people information that I was being fed by evil spirits. And that's the only spirits that talk to psychic mediums. But you can refer to some of my other videos in regards to that. The bottom line is that numbers know nothing about about you and we are to put our faith and trust in our Lord and our God the one who is sovereign the one who has created all things the one who knows the beginning from the end don't put your faith and trust in psychics in mediums in numbers or any other form of divination tarot cards angel cards angels are not communicating with us via numbers the numbers know nothing about you please don't go to Google and say oh I saw a number five 500 times in a row Jesus died for our sins, and he is our way to eternal life. And realize in him you can have rest, you will have truth, you will have life, and you will have the way. Beyond that, you need nothing else. God will provide all of your needs. I understand being grievous, hopeless, lonely, but what I'm telling you is that will all be fulfilled by Christ Jesus. You won't have to seek out these other things anymore for your fulfillment. That's all that divination does, gives you a temporary fix for something they can never fulfill. Thank you so much, Sister Jen, for this breakdown in numerology. And then there is this. John 5.43, I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. We're in a day and age in our church that all sorts of craziness is just being tolerated. And there's simply no excuse in 2024 for us to be able to fall prey to the same things that were happening back in the day. It's like they're all making a resurgence. And you need to be careful because there's a lot of witches in the church. There's a lot of people that just like the Pharaoh had his magicians in Exodus 7:11, and then the Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. You're going to stumble across moments. I've been in congregations. And let me tell you this, man. I used to be a church catcher. Around 2006, 2007, I was a church catcher. So my role in the church was to catch people. And I would catch you, I would lay you down, put a little blankie on you. What? That was, I, that was what I did, man. Step one, identify the target. Now a sure sign to know when someone is gonna fall is if they're swaying. And I even have a little, a little catchphrase for you guys. Okay, if they sway, don't stay. Get over there. Now, step two. Assume the stance, the position.
position of your stance should directly correlate with the weight of the person that you are going to catch. If you're standing like this, you can maybe catch the youth pastor. But you're not going to have a chance at catching the first lady, is that clear? Now if you were to catch someone who's maybe eaten the fat of the land, blessed and highly favored of the Lord, you're going to have to stand like this. All right? And if you have to catch the pastor, God help you if you have to help to catch the pastor. You're going to have to stand like this, at least. Step number four. Put them to bed. When they fall, they fall down hard, which is why it's your job to make sure that they are laid down like a newborn baby. They should be so comfortable, they feel like they're falling into a pit of 10 million cotton balls. Do you understand? Sir, yes, sir! What is our number one priority? Do not get sued, sir! And I'm telling you, a large majority of the people would just fall back. And it was dead weight. You know, some people, I'll be winking at the other church characters. I'll be like, bro, I'm going to need a couple of you, man, because this ain't going to be easy. This person's going to fall back like a ton of bricks. So we would have two or three church catchers. Now, hear me out here for a moment. One time, this guest preacher came to town, and that person, it was obvious that there was some diabolical stuff happening, man. There's some crazy diabolical stuff happening. This person would be able to move their fingers and do all sorts of stuff. And I'm telling you that there were people dropping on the floor like flies, man. It was the craziest thing ever. The scriptures were not opened once. The word of God was not preached once. The entire time it was all exalting the gifts that the person so-called have. So you need to be careful because there's a lot of witches that actually go to churches and they have a field day with people. Look at this lady here. She claims to have an anointed cake. She goes to the grocery store, she buys some Betty Crocker, some eggs, some milk, bakes a cake, and she claims to pray over it, lay some anointing oil over it, and if you eat of that cake, you're going to experience the quote-unquote anointing. And then she begins to feed people the cake, and they begin to experience all sorts of supernatural things. He loves you so much. So we're going to bless this cake. The cake is going to become something different for each one of you. It's going to become something different. Now, I want you to start getting in your mind right now what you need God to do in your life. Do not let this be a waste of the supernatural anointing. Because I'm prophesying over this cake today. Hallelujah. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, as I release this anointing oil upon this cake. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus. Let this cake. Let each one of these cakes. Yes, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Let each one of these cakes yes, Lord. become different. Jesus. Become different. Become different. Oh, Zaya, set me free. Did the scriptures not warn us in 1 Timothy 4.1? Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils? Absolutely. Seducing spirits, doctrines of devils, 100%. This lady also claims to have an anointed pillow, where she takes a pillow, prays over it, puts a little bit of that Goya oil on it, and all of a sudden you're going to have angelic dreams. But you know what? It's not free. Seventy-five dollars a pop. I prophesy that this year, even in this hour, as you rest your head to sleep uh, upon your anointed pillow, in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, as you let rest your head uh, upon the pillow uh, to sleep, uh, that dreams uh, and visions uh, shall come to you. Uh, not only shall they come to you, uh, but with the dreams uh, that heaven will open uh, and you will have uh, angelic uh, visitation uh, from the spirit. I receive in Jesus name. I receive it in Jesus name. And the sad part is, is that this is endorsed by the church. This is what church has been reduced to in America and all over the world. The church has been reduced to 
Miracle at the Movies with Greg Locke and Signorelli. The church has been reduced to it being nothing more than a corporation. The church has been reduced to this. And, and the sad part is, is that this has nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yet it's accepted. Yet it's promoted. The church has become a major business. It's becoming a major spectacle in the show. And a large majority of what people call revival is nothing more than false fire. And that is surely sad to say. I don't say any of these things because I'm happy to say them or because it gives me joy to say them. I say all of these things with sadness. And I say all of these things because we can all do better. I can do better. You can do better. We can do way better than this. Satan has been hard at work creating his own brand of churchianity out here. My brothers and my sisters, all I'm asking of all of you is Acts 17, 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily where those things were so. Listen, when I was back in my days in church, being a church catcher as an example, I had the best of intentions. I thought I was doing the right thing. I thought I was doing the right thing. All right. As you mature little by little, and trust me, I have a lot more maturing to do in life. You get to realize and you get to be convicted and God begins to change you and God begins to instruct you, instruct you that the things that you're doing, you shouldn't do any longer. As you continue in this walk with Jesus Christ, you're going to see these things that you once thought were biblical. And you're going to realize that when you compare them to the scriptures, you just simply don't find them there. The reason these things frustrate me is because it, it causes unbelief in a lot of people. You know the amount of people that go into a church and the person, because even with well intentioned, they'll lay hand on a person and they'll say, thus says the Lord. And they'll prophesy on a person, laying hands on a person. And then the person, five, six, seven years passed down the line. And now unbelief begins to build in that person because someone said that they spoke on behalf of the Lord. And this happens a lot of many church services when the person says, the Lord said this, the Lord said that. But did the Lord really speak if it didn't come to pass? What I'm asking of you, my brother and my sister in the Lord, is... To be a Berean, Acts 17, 11, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. That you become a Berean and that you become a person that as you're testing the many things that are happening out there in this world, that you also become your own log inspector, that you also inspect your own walk. That you also prune yourself and make sure that you are a person that's living for the Lord as well. Because I'll tell you this, the seducing spirits that are out there, the entities that are out there, Ephesians 6, 12 warns us of them. They aim at desensitizing us to sin. May the Lord rebuke the many ministries that are using the gifts of the spirit as a tool to manipulate people for money. May the Lord rebuke the many people and the many ministries out there that in the effort to make an extra nickel and an extra dime, they will milk anything and everything they possibly can. It's sad. It's sad for me to see someone say that there's a true revival, but you can only see that true revival when you purchase movie tickets. Um, maybe I'm old fashioned. Maybe I'm crazy. You let me know in the comment section. However, I believe that God called us to a higher standard. And I firmly believe in the gift of the spirit. I believe that God heals. I believe that God delivers. I believe that God is a miraculous God, but I also believe that I should be able to go to the scriptures and compare what you're doing to the scripture. And when I don't see what you're doing to in any of the examples in the scriptures, in any of the early church writings, when I don't see what you're doing there, I have to, at the very least, make sure that aside from being a log inspector and inspecting myself as I'm inspecting all things, that I allow the Heavenly Father to win and His scriptures to win and His Holy Spirit who teaches us all things, that I allow Him to win in my life because the devil aims at destroying us as a church. And he does so with the very people that rise up to claim to be prophets, teachers, ministers, apostles, you name it. Don't lose faith. Don't lose faith. God is real. God still delivers. God is still an awesome God. But as you're doing what you're doing for the Lord, make sure that you stay biblical, that we stay in sound doctrine, and that we stay like the Bereans. Because God is worth it. And because God is good. He is awesome. The Lord Jesus Christ is sufficient enough. I have never associated 
the tongues movement with demonic activity. There are many now that are doing that. I do not have the evidence to offer for that. I do know that there are several men that believe that definitely now that it is in that area. I've suspected, though, for a long time that faith healers are in some way associated with demonic activity. Did you know that there is no miracle worker promise for our day? I'm going to be very specific now. In Matthew, the 24th chapter, verse 24, our Lord is speaking of the great tribulation period, and he speaks of, he, he labels it here, for then, he says, shall be great tribulation. And then in verse 24, listen to him. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. The only miracle worker that's been promised, that's coming, it doesn't come from God. He comes from Satan, my friend. He is a minister of Satan. And that doesn't mean he wouldn't be attractive or whether she would be attractive. May I say to you, now, I know folk come to me and they say, Now, Dr. McGee, you are very harsh on these faith healers and they're very humble. None of them claim that they have any magical power or that they are really faith healers. They give God all the glory. I have some questions to ask. I've been bombarded with these that Mr. Oral Roberts is coming to town. And it doesn't say anywhere on the card that he's going to preach the gospel. It says, expect a miracle. I have news for him. I'm not expecting a miracle. And I noticed that Dr. Theodore Epp of Back to the Bible has now, in his publication, made a strong charge against him. He said when Oral Roberts went into the Methodist Church, we merely recorded it as a news item. But he says now we are ready to comment on it. And he made this statement. He said, <clears throat> Mr. Oral Roberts has had a loss, a great loss, in trying to explain to his Pentecostal friends of why he went in the Methodist church. And one of the reasons, in fact, now he gives his reason that he wants to bring this charismatic movement into the Methodist church. And then Dr. Theodore Epp asked this question, and it's a tremendous question. says, why doesn't he bring the gospel to the Methodist church, that great denomination that for years, preach the gospel, but no longer preaches it. And he is an attractive preacher, or Roberts is. Why doesn't he bring the gospel and not this movement into the church? That's a good question, my friend. Why do they talk about miracles? Why don't they talk about preaching the gospel? And I've been urged to go see this I don't know whether it's a Miss or Mrs. Coleman. I think there's been some question there. But uh, I've been asked to go see her. I'm not going, I can tell you that. And I, I have many reasons for not going. They say she's very humble. Well, she wrote a book, and I got at least 25 copies of it. Made a lovely bonfire. Uh, <laughs> And the title of a book is, I Believe in Miracles. Don't you believe in the saving power of Jesus Christ to save sinners? Why isn't that put forward? Why is a show put on to attract the multitudes? Why isn't the gospel of my Savior preached? May I say to you, this thing can't be of God until the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached, my beloved. Somebody says, well, he and she, they perform miracles. I have my doubts, but be that as it may, granted that they do. 
The Lord Jesus says the day is coming when they're going to come before me and say, Lord, Lord, in thy name did not we cast out demons and didn't we do many mighty works? And then he says, I'm going to say, I didn't even know you. May I say to you, friends, I've come to the place in my own ministry where I'm convinced that the person of the Lord Jesus Christ must be exalted and no man or woman to get in the way. No man or woman to get the glory. But for him to receive the glory, my friend, and instead of miracles, let's talk about him and what he's done for us and how he can save us from our sins. And suppose he did heal us. It wouldn't last very long. Most of us will be moving out of this world even under normal circumstances in a few years. Even if you got healing. My friend, the thing we need is to be saved from sin. That is the thing that is important. Now, if you'll notice that when Paul went into that area that he did not move out and perform any miracles. In fact, it says, God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. When he came into the city of Ephesus and saw this, Paul did not move into this area. They were acquainted with it. And what did they do? Paul worked at his trade. And you hear so much today about these handkerchiefs that contain healing. Well, a very interesting thing is, They were sweat cloths. When Paul was working there, making tents, he perspired. That's a warm climate. He would mop his brow, and I tell you, and I think maybe his arms, and those old sweat cloths were dirty. You see the healing in that day, you had to go and get clean in one of these springs. God rebuked the whole outfit. You could take an old dirty sweat cloth over, and people got healed. God rebuking them for going through that type of a rigmarole. And as uh, Dr. Van Eddings told me the other night, he said, he said, uh, had you ever stopped to think that Paul never gave up tent making in order to make handkerchiefs? He never went into that business. These were just sweat cloths and aprons with aprons he wore when he did that. And Paul did not perform miracles in that area. He left there and went up to Troas to Troy, and raised a boy from the dead to rebuke the whole outfit. And I say to you that God was rebuking them in that area. Now, may I say this in closing, that women were the healers, and Paul refused to heal in that area. And all of this is wrapped up in one package, spiritualism, demonism, Satan worship, and faith healings. They all come in one package, in the Word of God and in history. Now, will you listen to me very carefully in closing? If there was anyone who had the gift of healing, and I knew it. Do you think that I would hesitate for one moment to go to that individual when my life is at stake? Do you? May I say to you, if you think that I'd hesitate, you must think I'm a fool. But I'm not going. I have a question to ask you. It's not rhetorical. If you have an answer, And don't give me what I get all the time, produce evidence. Can you produce factual evidence that anyone has ever been cured of cancer by a faith healer? Produce them. I I want evidence. I'd have to have a doctor make the examination. And I'll tell you why. Because out here in Alhambra, and there was a daughter of a preacher that went to Miss Coleman's meetings. She had cancer. She went back to Alhambra and told everybody she'd been healed. They buried her a few months ago. 
I don't think I'm going. A member of this church got wrapped up in it. And, uh, and believe me, this preacher became pretty ordinary. And they began to follow this woman. May I say to you, the man was buried just the other day. How sad that people get caught up in that type of thing. I've done some investigating, and I'm serious. I believe with all my heart in faith healing, not faith healers. I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is still the great physician. I believe that you're to go to him and that we are to go to him. And I think it should be done in a scriptural manner. Will you listen to James 5.14? Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Somebody says, "Uh uh-oh, how about anointing with oil? There are two ways the word anoint is used in the scripture. One, it's ceremonial, and the other, it's medicinal. And it's different in each case, always different. And here, it's medicinal. He says, call for the elders. Oh, James is practical. Have the officers of the church pray for you. Why? Because the Lord Jesus is still the great physician and he'll heal. Don't go to a faith healer. Have the officers pray for you. And then he says, anoint with oil. Call the doctor and use a little medicine. Remember Hezekiah? God told him he'd heal him. But God says, you better put a fig poultice on that boy. And that's what he did. God says for you to use the best medicine you can get, but turn to the Lord Jesus as the great physician. And the apostles... And some in the early church had the sign gifts. And these sign gifts were these. They could heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. And in the book of Acts, both Paul and Peter did all. They healed the sick. They raised the dead, if you please. This was God's method. Spiritualism. Demonism, Satan worship, and faith healers all come in the same package. So this is it. This is the end. We've come to the end of this tunnel. We've come to the end of this rabbit trail. Thank you for just hanging in there with me. I know this was a lot. You know, I've exhausted this um, to the maximum. I've pushed this to the limit. But I felt I had to. Come. Let us pray now. Let's pray for a moment. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you because in the midst of all of these wolves, in the midst of all of these false teachings, in the midst of all of this chaos, you're still raising up a church. In the midst of all of this discouragement, in the midst of all of this entertainment disguised as revival, you are still the same God that delivered Noah, Moses, Daniel, David, Elijah. You're the same God. And you're with us today. Father, if there is a brother, if there is a sister watching this that is discouraged, if there is a brother, if there is a sister watching this that they're having issues in their home, issues with their families, issues with their children, issues with intrusive thoughts, issues with intrusive thoughts, 
that they may be able to cast down all imaginations and take him to the word of God in the name of Jesus. Because you are a real healer. You are a real miracle worker. You are an awesome God. And here in our homes, we can call upon you and you will heal and you will deliver and you will do so in a way that it glorifies you. Because you're that awesome. You're an awesome God. In the name of Jesus, amen. Yes, amen. Amen to that, Brother Tali. Well, I just want to thank you if you made it all the way to the end. Thank you for sitting through this. Thank you for giving it a listen. And I pray that this video will have blessed you. And um, yeah, continue to live on purpose, godly purpose. And let's just stick to the word of God. Amen.